This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Everybody, this is Bat Fans. Yes, we're still here. This is episode number one hundred and seventy-one. This is our second episode of twenty nineteen, Tim. Yes, um, already. Yeah, already. I, I I can't believe it, Tim. <laughs> Better. I mean, the year is going by so fast. <laughs> I mean, I'm not just saying that because we're kind of joking, but we're, January is pretty much almost over by the time you're listening to this episode. So oh, right. <laughs> I mean, it's it goes by quicker and quicker every year. So. Probably, no, no di- different here. It's probably because you and I are getting really old. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, time time moves by a lot quicker when you're older. No <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> but hey, you got the intro, new intro, right? Without any hiccups this time. So well, right off the bat, we're off to a good start with the new title. Well, that's because it's simple, Tim. Yeah, it's, <laughs> which was our plan. Still goal. Here. <laughs> yeah, bad fans are still here. Um, and of course, you always put the episode number. Um, uh, on the top, so um, even though it doesn't matter, really matter at this point. I mean, it's like uh, it's 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 more of a, more of a, an inconvenience. <laughs> <laughs> it's, be, it, it's because like you see the episode number, and it's like, oh man, we did 171 of these over five years. No, no, oh, well. We're going to be hitting our seventh year in April, oh. believe it or not, because we wow. started in 2012. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> how, yeah, old, how old were you seven years ago? You know, I'll just say I was still in my 20s, <laughs> <laughs> which is not the case now. I was 23 years old. And so, yeah, well, what the better part of your 20s was spent doing this podcast. And yeah. I got to say... Time well spent, Dane. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, because I was about to say, what a waste. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a waste of time time and energy. <laughs> but, <laughs> Come on, that 171 should fill you with pride and accomplishment that, yeah, we did 171 episodes of this, and we're still going strong. Well, because, yes, we're still here. <laughs> you know what does give me pride, Tim, is that we are on the 119th minute of the Dark Knight Rises minute-by-minute commentary. That is true. That might be more of an accomplishment than 171 episodes. Yeah, the so, fact that on this episode, we would have spent officially two hours <laughs> or 120 minutes doing this uh, commentary. It's, it's something you can tell your your, your, your grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, there was a seven-year period where I spent every two weeks – Watching a minute of The Dark Knight Rises. I mean, just I mean, think about it, Tim. Yeah, people can have, you know, trophies, accomplishment, high, like, education degree <laughs> hanging on their walls. But nope. Once we finish, I'm going to get a, you know, a plaque that says minute by minute commentary of Dark Knight Rises completed with the amount of time it took <laughs> of years. <laughs> was it 2000? I think we might have started in 2013 because they didn't do it right away. Oh, right. right the, so. the Blu-ray DVD didn't come out to the end of 2012, so we had to start it for like around 2013. So yeah. 
So I, it's still probably going to take around seven or eight years by the time we're finishing with it. So <laughs> like 2013, 2020 or 21, <laughs> Dark Knight Rises, minute by minute, accomplished, hanging on my wall on a plaque. I mean, that's going to blow everybody's mind when they see that. No, you shouldn't get a plaque. You should get one of those Little League um uh, you made it to the end of the season trophy. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that probably sounds more fitting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 120 yeah. episodes of our 171 have been spent talking about the Dark Knight Riders for a minute. Yeah. I mean, it's, how it's, awesome is that? It's kind of mind blowing if you think about it, because if you look back, it's six years, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. Of minute minute by minute commentary. <laughs> we, we've been watching this movie for six years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and imagine if this was the only way we've watched it. Like our first viewing is just oh, doing man. this bit by bit I, <laughs> commentary. I don't know how you do that. I mean, I know there's, you know, I guess the closest thing would be TV shows or the micro series, the, the Clone Wars micro series. There but you that go. didn't yeah. span six years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. But anyway, yeah, let's do our Dark Knight Rise of Minute by Minute commentary and get to the 100, 120th minute. Um, so grab your DVD, grab your VHS copy, grab your laser disc, your beta tape, grab your projector, grab your um, Blockbuster rental card, grab your Netflix physical media subscription um, copy, and of course, grab your VHS to DVD converted copy, Tim. The most important. The most, yes. The, the best quality, I think. <laughs> the way Christopher Nolan intended. <laughs> yeah. All those all, all those IMAX cameras <laughs> were made to be viewed on VHS. <laughs> were, to, were made to be viewed on a VHS to DVD copy. Um, so just cue it to the 119th minute. And I'm going to do the countdown. So, Tim, are you ready? I am ready. Let's make history here, Dane. All right. Three, two, one, play. And it's not the most exciting moment to hit the two-hour mark in the movie. No. <laughs> it's Gordon is trying to get fully out of hiding. It's funny. Recently, I've been seeing on Twitter some talk about how Foley is just awful in the movie. <laughs> how in every scene, he just doesn't add much to it. Oh, Which, like he's just there. So. Yeah. <laughs> and kind of overacting a little bit in certain moments. I don't know. I, I don't, not sure if I agree with that, but... So he, he he has to be the opposition to what Gordon's doing, right? Yeah. So I think that's what he's there for. He, he did. I I will get to there in a few more minutes. <laughs> but in his death scene, how that could have been done a little better, I thought. Because just the way it was even edited, it felt real choppy. But I know there was stuff cut. Yeah. But... At this point in the movie, we're not supposed to expect that he is going to show up for the fight. So, <laughs> even though I think we've seen stuff in trailers where he was in that vital sequence. But. And that's the two-hour mark. Wow. We did it, Dan. Is, it, is, it, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we I thought still... there would be fireworks or something. Uh, well, we're saving that for when we finish the actual movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we still got about, what, another half hour? Close. 45 minutes, I think. Yeah, so yeah. that. We're getting there. Yeah, so I was really giving some consideration to what should be our next movie. And mm-hmm. I I really and I mentioned this the last episode and I do think it should be um The Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 2 hours and 30, a little over. Yeah, it probably might be the same amount as The Dark Knight Rises actually. Oh, really? Uh, we should do that. Or, alternatively, we should do uh, one of the, the Lord of the Rings movies. Because, oh, because man. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I'm always, you know, what, what's that guy's name? Where did they go? Yeah, blah, blah, that's blah, true. Blah, you know? I could so, give you a first-hand lesson, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think we should do one of those, the extended version. Um, oh, three it's got cuts. It's extended yeah. edition or nothing in my book, so... <laughs> <laughs> Have you gone to one of those, um, uh, what is that called, uh, marathons at the movie theaters? No, I haven't really seen. I know there have been some, but none yeah. really too close to where I'm at to do a marathon for Lord of the Rings. Because 
they do screen the extended editions, which I've never seen on the big screen before, of course, because the only theatrical versions were released. So I've always wanted to see those in a movie theater. Just haven't been one that was I felt was worth it to go <laughs> or at least yeah. travel far enough. So I would love to, though. I think it would be really cool. Yeah. I wonder how you eat. How, how do you eat during that? Well, just from my one experience of doing that where for the Dark Knight trilogy yeah. back in 2012, there's usually like about 30 to like 40 minute like gap between each movie. Maybe oh. not that long. Maybe it's around 20 to 30 minutes, actually. But there's enough time for you if you wanted to, like, get out, get something to eat, then come back. Or come back with food. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so... so, They break it up enough to where you're not just sitting there and feel rushed to get up and go and come right back. Yeah, so I think... um, I'm going to leave the choice up to you, Tim. Uh, That's going to be hard, Dave, because... Yeah. Yeah. Last Jedi was a great choice, but now what you're bringing up about how fun Lord of the Rings could be with you kind of being <laughs> not too familiar with yeah. the Tolkien's world could be a lot of fun. So, yeah, going to be tough. But we got about 35 more episodes to, <laughs> for me to decide. So. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, why don't you tell people about our feature topic for this episode, too? Yeah, so our feature topic is going to be our annual best of and this year, of course, being the best of 2018. I know it's a little later than usual, but uh, we still got to always love doing these episodes where we give our favorites of what we enjoyed most in the past year. So um, even though this one's going to be a little later in the month and we're well into 2019, still want to get it out there. So, um, But this one is going to be a little different from how we've done it in the past because usually we would just focus on you know favorite Batman comic, favorite Batman artist, writer, and just mainly based on comic uh, the comic medium and just whatever big Batman event happened for that year. But we want to go bigger than that. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be doing a lot more stuff like favorite movies, TV shows, favorite album, video games, and still do the comic series stuff, but throwing a little more out there and everything we loved in the year of 2018 and the geek culture. And the one thing we're not doing though, is our least favorites this time. So as I don't know, felt, just want to keep it on a positive discussion, I guess. <laughs> Don't need to, if you didn't enjoy some, beat down the creative team that was involved with it. So just figured we'll nix the negative stuff and just do with our favorites of 2018. So, um, yeah, to kick it off, um, we'll start off with favorite movie of 2018. And I know a few episodes ago, or probably longer than that, but <laughs> probably in September after summer, we did our favorite movies of the summer. And on that one, there was a lot of great movies that year, but we said how after the summer, there's still some good stuff to look forward to, like Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and Aquaman that I wanted to see. So um wanted to save off talking about what the favorite movie was until we, I've seen those ones. But I'm going to have to say, even as, though, as much as I love Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and Aquaman, my number one movie of the year is still going to be what was my favorite movie of the summer, which was Avengers Infinity War. To me, that was just the event movie of the year. And just the way it left its mark on, you know, a moment that will be remembered in cinema forever, I think, with Thanos the snap and half of the <laughs> Marvel, universe, Marvel Universe disappearing and the effect it had on young viewers, which I experienced firsthand <laughs> sitting next to a little kid who was just traumatized <laughs> after seeing that. I think it's going to be something that was so impactful that a lot of young fans will remember um, for a long time. And just how successfully Marvel pulled off the ultimate team up movie after 10 years of building their universe and have it um, leading all up to this moment and pulling it off so well, balancing the characters, doing a great story. And yeah, I've seen some criticisms about it where you really doesn't work unless you've seen the other you know marvel movies and that is true but at the same time i think it's awesome that we're getting a movie that is like that because we're only used to seeing that in comics um for these event stories and now we're getting that in movies it's awesome i mean it's not the worst thing in the world if you have to go back and (laughs) watch a few more other good movies to really fully get this big event one so i thought it was the highlight of the year for me and a year that had great movies i mean if i had to pick my top five i could probably do top 10 but I'd probably go, you know, Black Panther, Aquaman, Spider-Man is the Spider-Verse, Solo, and then Avengers Infinity War as my top. So, yeah, I mean, 2018 was great, but I think 2018 is going to be even better <laughs> for movies. I mean, 
Star Wars Episode Nine. Enough said. But <laughs> you got a lot of other stuff like Avengers Endgame, and you know Shazam coming out soon on the DC front. There's a lot of cool stuff. But for 2018, Avengers: Infinity War was my favorite movie. Yeah, for me, I saw Infinity War. I saw Black Panther. Both are great movies. Um, but for me, I'm gonna go a little bit different, a little bit out there. Um, and it's a movie that didn't really get a lot of, I don't know if respect is the right word. I guess people didn't really care about it when it came out. Um, it came out at a bad time in October. Okay. Um, was marketed terribly, (laughs) (laughs) um, but that's going to be first man, uh, the the Neil Armstrong movie. For a second, I thought you were going to say Venom. I'm like, what? No, no. God, (laughs) no. (laughs) Um, yeah, it it wasn't marketed correctly. Um, I know some some of the critics didn't really like it uh, because you don't really get a sense of who Neil Armstrong was. But I I, I thought that that was kind of the point. You know, yeah. it's like he was just a normal guy who went to the moon, and that's the sort of feeling that I got. You know, he was just normal, and he just got to do this one thing that was that changed the world, you know? (laughs) So, um, I, I I mean, I guess critics were expecting to like a, a full on biographical movie, you know? And this was just certain aspects of his life. Like I, I had no clue he lost his daughter, you know, when she was young and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, all of his different Apollo missions before Apollo 11, you know? So I, I, I don't know. I liked it. Um, Acting is really good, and the visual effects, which apparently they they used minimal CGI, which is a really really good idea. Um, it was it was actually just like a, a like a um, a giant LED screen instead of actual you know CGI. Yeah, I find more movies are doing that now yeah. for like effect shots like that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So that really worked. Um, I don't think it was nominated for any Oscars. Um, which is surprising. And, so yeah, I remember when that was coming out, like everyone, like the buzz around it was like, "Oh, this is going to be like a for sure like best picture Oscar contender." Yeah, but yeah, you're great. right. Yeah, it I didn't was, get nominated for best picture. It was directed by Damien Chazelle, who did uh, La La Land and um, what's that drumming movie? Uh, Whiplash. With, yeah, yeah, Whiplash. I want which I so, haven't seen, but I want I still want to check that out. Being the, <laughs> the music fan that I am. Yeah, I actually saw Whiplash. That was. That's a really good movie, especially if you're a musician. Um, I saw La La Land. <laughs> uh, it's not that um, one. I kind of knew probably wouldn't be up my alley. <laughs> being it's a not. Yeah, it's not really my cup of tea. I know why people liked it. It's got a. It's, I mean, there's a love story and stuff, but. Um, yeah, and it not, was a best really, picture winner for about a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, I did see Moonlight and. Uh, the the movie that actually won yeah. the Oscar, <laughs> and um, yeah, that Moonlight is actually I, I feel deserved it. Mm, okay. um, that's one of the best movies I've seen in a while. Um, and uh, The Shape of Water, not so much. I didn't like that movie. You know what? I saw that in November for the first time, yeah. and maybe it was too overhyped. But I kind of agree. Like, like I just, oh, it just didn't really work for me <laughs> That's yeah, I, it's like best picture i'm not sure if that really like that i can really appreciate counts. the story yeah. he was trying to tell there there's some right. great ideas but at the same time like one thing i kind of lost sympathy for the creature after he ate ate that cat i was like <laughs> 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 like i was i was with this guy for a little bit then he just eats this bites this cat's head off and like i kind of lost it there but <laughs> yeah and remind me of the ending that's like um he they, he gets set free right uh uh-huh. yeah, yeah because the girl gets shot and then he brings her back to life and they just kind of go right. live under the water together right 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 right. they go live under the water mm. wow yeah so um anyway <laughs> that's our review of best picture winners in the last uh two years yeah <laughs> um but yeah my favorite movie of uh 2018 is is definitely um first man yeah, I do want to check that one out. Just from the trailers, it looked pretty cool. Yeah, it's really so, good. Yeah, good to hear. All right, so our next category up is our favorite TV show of 2018, and for me, this one is going to be 
uh, sadly, what is season three, but also the last season of Daredevil. And as we were watching it, <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be the last season. But man, it, it went out with a bang. I got to say, this season was great. It did start off a little slow for me in the first two or three episodes. But and once it got going, it didn't let up. And it was just a great story and character arcs for a lot of characters in the series. Obviously, for Matt Murdock and Wilson Fisk, even Karen Page. It just all of it came together for just a really compelling story. And then you throw in a new character like Bullseye, who since the series was first created, we were all waiting for to be brought into it. And they did a great job with his characterization. A little different, but man, they nailed it as far as be, bringing him in to, to be a foil for Daredevil, which is so good. The action in this series was off the whole series in general, but this season, man, it was off the chart. That one shot take of his prison fight was incredible. But then the highlight for me was the episode where Bullseye attacks um, the the newspaper that Karen Page works at and the fight he has with Matt Murdock there. It was just awesome. The way he was using uh, objects to throw and deflect at, at each other was just really, really well done and choreographed. So cool. But the culmination of the fight between Murdock and Wilson Fisk, uh, just so good. The story in it was really well done and just really diving into these characters and, you know, you know, what – you know what they go through as far as the struggles they have to do or have to deal with in their lives and not just the heroes too but the villains that's what makes it so great so it did not disappoint it ended it wrapped up nicely too where you know everything was kind of resolved uh, with the characters it ended up in a spot where everyone's going to get a fresh start and it was a satisfying ending where sadly like i said it is the last season it did end in a way that kind of made you feel that, yeah, easily can, it can easily continue. But if this was it, it would be a satisfying conclusion where like the status quo is where it probably should be. At the same time, leaving you with a little tease for what could come in season four with Bullseye, which sadly we're not going to get. But man, this last season of Daredevil, I could not be happier with it. Just the series in general, man, it's going to be up there as one of my favorite comic book adaptions ever with the performances, the action, the stories that were created for it. It was just, they knocked it out of the park each season, I feel. But definitely for, the, for this last one, it was probably one of the, see, I don't know where I'd rank it just because uh, probably an unpopular opinion is that I think season two is the best. I loved everything they did with the Punisher and even the stuff with the hand. I know that's kind of gets nitpicked a lot or mm, <laughs> not everyone's right. favorite. I still like that, that they brought in that element of Daredevil's, history and his comic book stories into the season i thought it, they made it work well in that but the stuff with punisher i thought was the greatest things they've done in this whole series so that why that's why season two is my favorite but i think season three might be my second followed by season one but all three are just fantastic so yeah i've got to give the nod to daredevil for the best tv show of 2018 um for me the the, the daredevil show and um i saw the punisher uh, show just uh, released their second season. Yeah, I'm it's right kind of, in the middle of that, like on yeah. episode five right now. Yeah, it's kind of like what? What's the point? I mean, the, the Daredevil's done. Punisher's probably going to be done after yeah. the season. So, what's the point? But I mean, still, I mean, I get. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to think that while you're watching it. But at the same time, there's still a good story being told there. So, <laughs> just got to enjoy it while it's there. Yeah, uh, but speaking of those shows being on Netflix, you know. Uh, my favorite show of 2018 is also on Netflix, um, and it's a series I didn't really see them promote. Um, I don't know why uh, or how how or why I started watching it, but um, it's a show called Dairy Girls. Um, it's yeah, I don't think I've even heard of that. Yeah, it's it's on Netflix. Um, it's it's about a, a three girls and a boy who live in uh, Ireland during the Irish Civil War. Uh it's it's a comedy. It doesn't take itself seriously. It's it's a it's a show that I you know, I, I, I really it really answered a question of like that that I've had for a long time is like even though there's like this conflict going on, what happens to like people that don't aren't really directly involved mm -hmm. with the conflict? And the answer is life goes on. You know, the, the, these girls still have to go to school. They have problems with their parents. It's a, it, I mean, it's a comedy. It's, uh, 
I mean, even though they're living through this terrible time, you know, in Derry, which, you know, was like one of the bloodiest places during the, the, the Civil War. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a comedy. It can be, it can be funny. It can be crude, it, but it can also be heartfelt. And, you know, it's, it's that constant reminder that, yeah, these wacky things are going on, but there's still, you know, people are still dying. You know, there's still this conflict. And I feel like that they, you know, they, they sort of balance that really well. And it's great performances by the, by the three actresses and the actor. It's, it's just a really great show, R- really well written. Um, so yeah, for me, uh, my favorite TV show is uh, Dairy Girls on Netflix. Okay, I might have to check that out because yeah. the premise of it sounds like you said a period that was a dark time, but yet it works as a comedy. But it doesn't, you know, forget. It still takes it. Yeah, yeah. forget how the seriousness of it. Right, right. And how many you, episodes are in it? Uh, six. There's six. Okay, episodes. so it's one of the shorter ones. Yeah, yeah. So and they're all thirty minutes. So oh wow, you know, okay. you're not sitting there for a long time. Um, so yeah, uh, Dairy Girls is definitely my favorite TV show. Cool. All right, next up we're gonna head to the music front, which is a favorite album of 2018. And for this one, I'm gonna go with a band that just put out their eighth record, but it's been around since the late 90s. This is the Australian punk rockabilly band, The Living End, and their album Wonder Bar. And wait, I've, Tim, you, you know how long it's been since I've heard. The words "the living end." How long? It's been a while. <laughs> I, I haven't heard that bad name in a long time. Yeah, because they're not really big over here. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, they had their breakout hit "Prisoner of Society" back in like '98 and '99 when they probably peaked over here in the U.S. But ever since then, uh, they've consistently put out albums, great albums actually, and but just never really made it here. This continued to be popular in australia and like the uk and even japan more and more so when you, over here which is a shame but they toured they came down here in 2016 for their last record which was like the first time they've been in the u.s in forever like i cannot miss them <laughs> i don't like i don't care where they're playing i'm gonna go but fortunately they played in a, in a venue that was real close to where i'm at so it's like yes <laughs> i don't have to travel far and i get to see a band that i couldn't i've been waiting to see for a while but the album they put out this year was really really good and they're a band who rarely disappoints me when they put out a new album they each one is different but yet it has their signature style that with that is why you like the band and they can carry that forward with each new album with trying new things and wonder bar was no exception and uh, i just love the variety we get on this album um there's some great rockers especially the last track rat in a trap it's just a great almost like throwback to 70s rock and then you get um, the fourth track, The Death of the American Dream, which is probably my favorite. It starts off as this fast punk rockabilly song. But then at the end, it turns into this acoustic guitar, just an acoustic guitar and the vocals. But it's recorded just on a cell phone. There's video footage of him recording the track where it's just the producer holding the cell phone, recording him singing and playing the guitar. And it has this you know old static quality to it. But it works really well with the song and the lyrics that he's saying to it. So that's great. And then... Um, just a lot of songs, the standard rock stuff, but then you get songs where it's just him and the guitar that sounds really good, like the song Amsterdam. And the, his, Chris Jenny, the singer and uh, guitar player, he has great lyrics, and I think he really shines on this one, too, with uh, talking about you know serious themes here um, and this, the way he uses lyrics and the poet, the poet in him and making things rhyme. I think he always finds the perfect words to use together in his lyrics. I think it was on display here at Wonder Bar. So um, that ends up being my favorite album of 2018. Uh, for me, it's 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 one of the the biggest letdowns, and um, I had to sort of uh, do a little bit of digging before I, um, and I had to spend a lot more money. <laughs> before I, okay. it became my best um my favorite album of the year and that's going to be um bob dylan's more blood more tracks the bootleg uh series mm, okay. um i don't know if you know but blood on the tracks is sort of like a um it's it's i think it's considered one of his best albums um but what he did was he recorded the album as 
an acoustic album in New York. But then he didn't like it, so he he went back to Minnesota, and he re-recorded all the tracks with a full band. And so there's a bunch of different takes, a bunch of different, like, rehearsals, um, a lot of... A lot of the time, it's it's like an entirely different song with the same lyrics. Um, but so this bootleg series comes out, and I buy it, right? And I listen to it, and it, it, it it's like they took the worst takes, right? Oh, really? And they, they put it on the standard edition, right? I, uh, I, I'm not sure what they call it, but let's just say standard edition. There's 11 songs on it, Um and I was like, man, because I had heard these tracks before, but only on vinyl. Mm. Um, it was a vinyl to MP3 copy. And like, yeah, like I've heard these songs before. But then this <laughs> this one disc regular version comes out and it's like, ah, oh, they took like the worst takes and they put it on this. Like, why would they do that? But then I, I, I do a little digging and then I find out that there's this box set i think there's like five or six discs okay this, this entire box set right and yeah it, it it definitely they 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 essentially put everything that he ever recorded during this time period into this box set so that's why it's my 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 favorite album of 2018 i mean there's like like eight different versions of one song um a lot of them are like rehearsals uh you can hear him talking he's working it out in in the studio in his head um it's it, it, it it's just a really great document and i appreciate it for that and there's some takes that i, I hadn't even heard before um so that's always great so that's why the six disc deluxe edition i guess you could say um <laughs> is uh my favorite uh, album of 2018 i just have to pay like (laughs) what is it 70 dollars (laughs) more hey as long as it's worth it yeah it's the the, now let me just say the uh box set is six hours long so (laughs) you're definitely getting your money money's worth and there's some other great box sets that came out this year. The White Album 50th Anniversary box set. I mean, oh, really? the, the remaster on that sounds phenomenal. I haven't listened to all the demos yet, but just yeah. hearing the remastered versions of the actual White Album, it sounds incredible. And then the Tom Petty came out with a, a box set of uh, American Treasure, which has some uh, demos and like alternate takes and live performances, which was cool. So this was also a good year for just you know remastered and box sets of albums for artists too. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like just a regular current artist that I listened to this year. Mm. And yeah, nothing's really coming to mind. So yeah, yeah. definitely the, the the Blood in the Tracks box set, even though it's like $100. <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm sorry, Dean, I haven't listened to that album by Fang Island just yet. Oh. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, have... I I just wanted to get your opinion because I'm not sure if I like it or if I don't. Or it reminds me of Weezer, but not really <laughs> like Weezer. But, okay, because yeah. I definitely want to check it out. But Weezer is actually the reason I haven't listened to it yet because I was about to. I've, I've been oh, busy this week, so I've had time uh, to. But when I was going to, Weezer yeah. surprisingly dropped the Teal album. <laughs> I was like, oh, I gotta listen to that. <laughs> Isn't it covers? I was like, just covers. Just covers. Yeah. Yeah. Which is causing a lot of like people to get upset. <laughs> I was like, it's just a cover album. If you don't like someone covering a song you like and hold in high regard, just don't listen to it. <laughs> I don't see right. what the big deal is about being upset about it. Right, and also that like, it's funny because I was just reading an interview with uh, Rivers Cuomo, mm-hmm. and he said like he he understands that some people don't like the direction that the band's going in, mm-hmm. but he feels that he has to do that he has to change he can't just you know do the blue album again or pinkerton yeah. again you know so oh just just really weird that i i read that they released the album people don't like it <laughs> and i would complain. i would say it's split yeah there's i've seen a lot of people who think like man like what who like it and generally don't get the total negative reaction to it but it is out there it's just puzzling why people will feel a cover album is so offensive i guess <laughs> it's weird but i like it a lot there's some really good covers of some classic songs on there but 
I will get to that album eventually, Dane. I promise. <laughs> it's all good. I, it, yeah, I just wanted your opinion because I was like, you know, this is really good, but I'm not sure if there's enough there. But I'm taking a wild guess that it's a concept album. No. Oh, wow. No, it's not. <laughs> because I've seen like, when I looked it up on Spotify, I was about to listen to it before Weezer dropped their album. I was looking at like other artists like you might like with this band and that one you we had me listen to the what a titus andromeda andromeda was yeah was titus that? andronicus okay yeah like yeah. they were on there i know they did that concept album it was like well i wonder if i've got to be prepare myself for another <laughs> concept record <laughs> no it's it's quite the opposite it's just songs um that kind of go nowhere and and um and i think the album's only like 35 minutes so mm, okay yeah well, that is very Weezer-like, <laughs> short <laughs> albums. So. But moving on from music, we'll go on to our favorite video game of 2018. And for me, it came down to the last three games I played of 2018. I mean, the, that year for video games ended with a bang. You got Spider-Man, Red Dead, and then Super Smash Brothers all within like months of each other. <laughs> and it was great. And it did work out perfectly where I finished each game just in time before the next one came out. So, <laughs> But... Out of those three, I got to give the nod to Red Dead Redemption 2. And starting off with it, I probably wouldn't have thought that. But by the time I finished it, it was one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. I mean, you've heard us talk about it on several episodes ago when we first started playing it. But having since beaten it, and I still want to go back and do stuff, you know, after you finish the game. Because there's still more of the world you can go in and explore and finish up some missions you weren't able to before I beat it anyway, I know I've left some undone. But man, just the story of this game, the characters and the character development, it's just so, so good. I mean, it really sticks with you. And that's what was great about Red Dead Redemption, the first one. And I'm just so glad I continued with the second one with a new main character that you're investing your time in and really got um, emotionally connected with and invested in. So the outcome and what happens just really sticks with you. And I just love the whole character dynamic of the gang you're in the you know the dutch the dutch gang really just the other characters who made it up and just how you interact with them and had that family element was just great where um i guess i'll still keep it kind of spoiler free but i I think going into it you probably know there would be characters in that gang who die and and when they do die you really feel bad and it hits you so it is a great narrative i mean one of the best Red Dead is going to be remembered for one of the best story-driven games ever, I think. And now they're two for two. And just when you think you see it all in the main story, you get to the epilogue in that portion. And it just, to me, takes it to another level, especially for anyone who's played Red Dead Redemption 1. And just, yeah, it just really makes you appreciate the characters that were created in this game. Not to mention, too, the fun gameplay aspect of this riding in the wild west having gunfights the action and it's always fun never get tired of getting in shootouts with rival gangs or pinkertons and all that stuff or those other organizations you're fighting it's just so much fun and just a beautiful world to explore the graphics on it are incredible so red dead redemption 2 is pretty much the complete package in what i look for in a game and i know there's even more to it because i haven't even touched the multiplayer which i hear is pretty much a whole other game in itself but i'm kind of looking forward to doing that but yeah i gotta give it to red dead but it was a great year for video games especially at the end but like i said with spider-man was amazing i thought that would probably end up being my game of the year but then red dead came out and then smash brothers i love as we talked about in our last episode that's i still haven't played it as much lately since i finished the main storyline but i still go back to it here and there just just to have some fun with these great nintendo characters so yeah, it, this year video game ended with a bang, and it was culminated by Red Dead Redemption Two. Did you see the 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 real life Pinkertons are suing Rockstar? Really? No, yeah. I didn't see that. Yeah, <laughs> Why that, for making them look like real bad guys? <laughs> I mean, I guess they're still around. Um, I, I I wouldn't think so, but yeah. apparently they are. Um, but uh, yeah, they're 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 suing uh, Rockstar for making them look bad. <laughs> or so, or, or, I, I, I can't remember what it was like i think it's because they are the bad guys and yeah i mean they're pretty much too. <laughs> there's nobody likable you meet it there's a pinkerton in the game so <laughs> yeah um but like you i played red dead 2 and i played spider-man and i'm gonna surprise you tim because i'm not sure if this, this goes with the rules uh of this feature topic but i just can't 
not mention it as my favorite game of 2018 that I've played in 2018, I'd say. And that's Super Mario Odyssey. Ah. <laughs> hey, it's never too late for when you start playing a video game, so yeah. always you have that be your favorite. <laughs> it's Super Mario Odyssey. It's, like I said when I reviewed the Switch, it's probably the funnest uh, game I've ever played. Um, I've had so much fun with it. It doesn't take itself seriously. Um, it's the same thing over and over again, but it doesn't feel like it's the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. It's it's weird. Um, um, and finding the moons is always really interesting. Like, um, just, you know, the that one level where you, you have to use the millipedes. I don't know if you uh, remember that. You have yeah. to use the millipedes to get yeah. all of the moons. I really enjoyed that, um, <laughs> even though it was painstaking and, like, you had to position yourself in the right way and you know ju- just the entire experience like how it's presented to you and how one thing that really surprised me how well it worked was the um how you go into the tube and all of a sudden you're back in the r- original Mario Brothers I game. love that and not only that not only do the graphics switch but the music also does that's my favorite yeah. part like i love the soundtrack when because mario Odyssey has a great soundtrack but when it goes yeah. to that 8-bit style oh man i'm in heaven <laughs> yeah yeah and that's another thing too about um mario uh, super mario odyssey is how well they use music and sound and like i just finished the new dunk city part of uh-huh. the game and how you have to go and find each band member. Yeah. <laughs> and who, it depends on who you find first. Like, I found the drummer first because he's right there, right? Um, and you, you find him, and he's, he, he agrees to play um, for the big city hall meeting thing. And you go into the, the city hall, and it, it's just a drummer. And then you go and find the bassist, and then you go find the guitar player, and then you go find the saxophone player. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, 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 you're you building a band. And then at the end of the level, which is really awesome, by the way, I I love how they did the end of that level. Um, yeah, the, the Donkey the, Kong. Yeah, there's like, well, yeah. first there's like a, a whole music video. And that's then, right yeah <laughs> and then you go into the tube and then it's donkey kong you're playing uh, and i didn't know it at first but i was like this kind of reminds me of donkey kong like <laughs> like, like, like these the, these rolling things that i have to jump over this reminds me of donkey kong am i am i playing a donkey kong game and sure enough you you, you get to the final stage and you, you, it's donkey kong you know and i i it's just so much fun and time flies when you know i'm playing this game um they didn't make their open world too big um so things are easier to find and you know and that's the thing too where it's like you kind of have these games nowadays and you know i i i play them i love them like red dead or assassin's creed odyssey um where they create this large interactive world right but for some reason, the world that they built in Super Mario Odyssey, I, I feel more connected to that than I did with with Red Dead Two or uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. You know, I, so, I know what you mean. Sometimes smaller can be more effective. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so weird. It's like uh, it's it, and and it's so fun. You know, it's 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 so much fun, even though. You know, you're banging your head against the wall because you can't figure out a certain pattern or whatever. You know, it's like it's fun. It's fun to figure it out. And I, like I said, I haven't had this much fun in a video game in a long time. I mean, you would have to go back to probably the Super NES, I'd say. Maybe, wow, man. maybe, <laughs> <That's wave. laughs> maybe the N64. Well, maybe yeah. Mario 64. But... Yeah, maybe Mario 64. Maybe GoldenEye. I had a lot of fun in. Um, but yeah, it's been a while. So so yeah, that's why my my favorite video game, even though it wasn't released in 2018, <laughs> uh, is my favorite. Uh, uh, Super Mario Odyssey is my favorite video game I played this year. I can't go wrong with that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it's never too late to enjoy a video game, however how old, how old it is. I'll yeah. gladly accept that as your favorite for 2018. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now moving on to the comic side of things. 
Um, first off, I'm going to do favorite comic series of 2018. And this one, I'm just to follow the same for you too, Dane, but even more so than the past year is my comic reading has gotten a little smaller <laughs> this year, right. unfortunately. Uh, I wish that wasn't the case, but sometimes uh, this is the way life works out. We just can't afford to get every single comic that's coming out. So it has gotten a little smaller. So my choices were limited this year, which is kind of why I kind of want to get rid of like the negative side of <laughs> when we're talking about our worst writer, worst artist type of stuff. Is The other reason would be because there's I haven't read a lot and a lot of the stuff I read is in has been bad so i just like kind of keep it where i'm making sure i'm getting the books that i'm enjoying so but for the best series of 2018 so mainly my comic readings consisted of batman titles superman and star wars but now that the new green lantern started again i have been getting that so it was so this most of the year it's been dwindled to like three titles mainly that i've been reading so um and my favorite one out of all those it's got to be the darth vader series that wrapped up um, just a few months ago. It was wow. <laughs> I just wanted to achieve it. This comic series was hands down the best Star Wars comic story probably ever. I would go as far as saying that and just hey, one Tim, of the best Star Wars stories you're you, gonna read. You, you know the uh, Darth Vader um, comic series. Mm-hmm. Do they go into like um, you know after the first Death Star explodes stuff like? Do, uh-huh. do they go into like how Palpatine reacted to that and how Vader was like, that wasn't me. That was, you know, I, I told you guys to plug the hole. You know? yeah. <laughs> do, they do, do show do they go into that. Yeah. In the first Darth Vader series, they do. And even in the beginning of the main Star Wars title, they go and tell you know, Palpatine is still upset at Vader, even though you oh. know, <laughs> he, the Death Star wasn't his thing. He still got blamed for his failure. But they do go into that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering because, like I said, I just rewatched that movie and, you know, I was like, oh, I wonder how Vader explained this because Tarkin isn't around to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, Peter Cushing isn't around. so He's pretty much like it. the only one left to take the fall. Yeah, to, to take the blame for everything because, like, yeah, I was just wondering about that. But what's great about this last Darth Vader series is that it takes place immediately after episode three i mean it starts with vader coming you know off of that chamber he's in when he just first got his armor and the conversation continues with him and palpatine and the way this series dives into anakin's mind and what he's thinking of as you know his life has changed forever is just fantastic we get these great moments where like anakin meditating within the forest but it's like the dark side version of meditating the visually it's like really cool stuff and the, the story arcs we got throughout this run was fantastic. It starts off first with how Darth Vader created his first lightsaber as a Sith, which was great. And then him kind of going after a rogue Jedi with Jocasta New, who was still alive and survived Order 66 and was still uh, kind of needing to get some information from the Jedi Temple archives. And then we go into a great arc with uh, Vader on Mon Cala with the Mon Calamari still, you know, trying to, who are with the Empire, but are trying to resist it as well. And still weeding out the Jedis who are trying to help him. But man, the last arc was incredible. It goes into how Vader created his castle that we see on Mustafar. And the news, I shouldn't say new, but because they kind of explore this on Star Wars Rebels, but the stuff in it dived more into with the Force and Vader and just how he's dealing with things because he's still trying to trying to find a way to bring Padme back. And that goes into a way, like the castle plays into that. And then you throws in another added element of an ancient Sith coming back uh, to help Vader, but yet he's really trying to help himself. Just some great stuff. And if anyone's seen the episode of Star Wars Rebels, A World Between Worlds, know how trippy that was and just <laughs> the new elements it added to the Force, um, the final issue of Darth Vader kind of taps into that well as as well. <laughs> and boy, it just didn't deli- it, it didn't disappoint, I should say, as far as just really making you appreciate the story that was created here for Darth Vader in this comic and this is adding new elements to the character that I'm just, I just love <laughs> it. Just, like I said, it, the way it dives into the mental state of Anakin slash Vader here is just fantastic. And I just cannot recommend it enough. I just think it's, I would dare say required reading for any star Wars fan. I think it's that good. And just throwing in great elements into Darth Vader that would just 
make you appreciate and love the character even more if that was even possible because of him being an iconic character for over 40 years this comic just adds more to it so i just can't give i give it the highest praise and just cannot recommend it enough like i said so that gives it the title of my best comic of 2018 I'm going to do things a little bit different, Tim, and uh, w- w- why don't you go through your comic writer and comic artist okay. of 2018, because uh, I got a book that I read that um, might go a little long on, so... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, just sticking with the Darth Vader front, I got to give my favorite comic writer of 2018 to Charles Soule. Um, for all the reasons I just said, he just knocked it out of the park and just really got the character of Darth Vader and just what makes him great and fascinating to read about. And so, yeah, um, much as I praise the series, I got to praise the writer who came up with the ideas and the stories to dive into here. And Charles Soule did a phenomenal job with it. So I'm hoping he does more in the star wars comic realm i'm pretty sure he is but it was kind of a bummer to see him uh end the darth vader series when it was going so strong but yet it's better to end on a high note and just finish the stories he wanted to tell and have that be it instead of having to continue on and on and maybe lose quality or have a different creative team come in and not have it be as good the fact that he was able to tell or tell one cohesive story throughout 35 issues was probably the right decision and just end up creating one of the best Star Wars stories ever. So Charles Soule gets my favorite writer of 2018. And for my favorite artist, I'm going to go to Lee Weeks, who's uh, done some work on the Batman title. And my favorite um, work of his ends is in that arc that Tom King did with uh, Mr. Freeze and Bruce Wayne as part of the jury for that case. I mean, that story itself was great. That was That's probably my runner-up after uh, the Darth Vader series um, was that particular arc with Bruce Wayne on the jury for that Mr. Freeze case. And this is the way Tom King dove into Bruce really going in, analyzing, you know, him as Batman and throwing in those uh, biblical elements to it too, which I thought was really well done. So, but on the art front, I felt Lee Weeks really did a good job. I just love his style that he does for, you know, just not only uh, Batman, because that last page where Batman goes, Bruce gets into his classic suit again, might be my favorite piece of art of 2018. (laughs) I just love that design that look that lee weeks did for it it was phenomenal but the way he did his human characters too like bruce wayne and the other members of the jury commissioner gordon mr freeze it just i just like his art style uh in general so he's going to be my favorite artist of 2018 and i also got to throw in too he also had my favorite piece of art in batman number 50 the wedding issue that had a bunch of different guest artists drawing um different uh images of batman and catwoman but lee weeks had my favorite in that one as well so he gets my top artist pick of 2018 all right so um, i'll let you go on Dave. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'm gonna do things a little bit different um i and, and mine's gonna be a book um as you know tim we're both sports fans right mm-hmm. uh i am a hockey fan and tim is oh old, really but... see I, all these years i never knew that <laughs> Yeah. So I do like um, soccer too, but I don't ever think I've heard you talk about hockey. So I, uh, I'm a New York Islanders fan. Um, and a lot of people don't know their history. It's, it's really weird. I, I, I read a book called, uh, we want fish sticks, which is, um, it's, it, it doesn't paint them in a good light and <laughs> I'm going to explain. So, uh, the, the Islanders, they, they had their first season in 1972. That's when they were created. That's when they joined the league, right? <laughs> um, then they won four straight Stanley Cups um, in the early 80s. It's the, uh, they're the last American sports team to do that, to win four championships in a row. Um, and they went to five. See, that bugs me because it should yeah. be the Yankees with 2001, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Yankees do play into this story, Tim. <laughs> it's really weird, but um, so oh, what? F- uh, f- first of all, I want you to open up Google, Tim. Okay, and uh, type in New York Islanders jersey. Do you have that up? Okay, yeah. You see it? It's uh, uh-huh. blue and orange. Yep. Okay, now open up another tab. And okay. type in um, Islanders Fisherman Jersey. Okay. Do you see what it looks like? 
Yeah. Okay. Looks awful, right? Yeah, I gotta say the first one's better. <laughs> okay, so this is the story of how that second one came into creation. Um, but anyway, yeah, like so they 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 went four straight Stanley Cups. They went to five. They won nineteen straight playoff series, uh, which is 70, 76 games, um, and it's a American sports record. Um, they're the only American hockey hockey team to win the Stanley Cup four times. Um, but then things started to fall apart, you know, in a really, really bad way, which led to, I don't know what to call it, Tim, uh, financial shortcomings, right? Okay. <laughs> so they decided to switch the only logo, which is that first one, right? Uh-huh. Uh, they decided to switch in the 95-96 season to, you know, in hopes that it, it would boost merchandise sales so that they, you know, they can make some money. Um, because at this point, there is no money. They, they have to trade away good players so that they can re- remain afloat, you know, because they can't afford to pay high-priced players. Um, so, yeah, they, they decided to change their logo. They didn't know what to change it to because what do you associate with with an Islander, with, with Long Island. I mean, do you have any guesses, Tim? Oh, you're, I thought <laughs> yeah, you were saying yeah. that. <laughs> Would it be fishing? <laughs> Fishermen? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, some of the ideas were ducks, lighthouses, even like dinosaurs. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. I was reading in the book, like dinosaurs, because uh, technically there was dinosaurs there at one point. You know, like <laughs> I guess I discovered everywhere. some fossils and bones over there. <laughs> like I guess See, that's um, more the Denver, Colorado thing, though. Yeah, yeah, but but technically there were dinosaurs a long time ago, right? Um, but you know they decided on a fisherman, uh, even though the, the the fishing industry on Long Island was dying. Um, but they decided to change it because I mean they decided on fishermen because of a Billy Joel song. Um, oh really? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a song called Down Easter Alexa. I don't know if you ever heard it, but uh, it's about fishermen and it's not even one of his big hits. <laughs> um I guess got to give him credit for using, you know, going for the deep cut, but yeah. <laughs> not just choosing the most popular song. <laughs> yeah, so they decided to change their logo and you know, they had an absentee o- owner who lived in Florida and had, he had his son run run the team with the uh, group of four guys so it was four guys who owned 50 percent of the team and one guy who owned the other 50 percent and the reason why i'm telling you this is because the book gets into this and it 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 just paints a picture of how bad things were Mm. um so so yeah they do that they 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 barely try to focus group test the 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 logo and they play obviously yeah they 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 play the 95 96 season with it um, which immediately goes bad. Um, no one likes the new logo, especially the people who were, who were there for the, the, the dynasty years. Um, they lose a ton of games. Of course, they have a terrible coach who made some really, really bad decisions, trading away good players who eventually became really good players, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and yeah, it's 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 just a terrible time. They're they're at the bottom of the standings, um, and nothing is going right for them. Um, so the next season, they decided to, to ditch their fisherman logo, but the NHL rules said that they can't because uh, of the vendors who stocked all this merchandise. You know, they need time uh, to sell it. That makes sense. I was going to say why. Yeah, but that that makes sense. They need time to sell off all of the merchandise before they rebrand, but. So they're stuck with this for another year, right? And then they decide to bring back the old logo, but only for certain games, home games, right, as a third jersey. Um, so things are awful. There's an absentee owner. They tried to change the logo. It's not selling. Nobody likes it. <laughs> the team is doing terribly. Um, and more importantly, the team's not recouping what they're losing, right? Um, so out of nowhere... This this Texas millionaire named John Spano said he had reached terms to buy the team, right? At, uh, I think it was like 
165 to 170 million dollars. Um, it's like sounds like nothing now when you yeah. compare it about how much it cost to buy teams. Yeah. So he said he was going to pump some serious cash into into the team so they could buy players. He was going to fix the Nassau Coliseum, which is falling apart at this point. Um, and more importantly, he was going to keep the team on Long Island because that that was another threat that they were going to move someplace mm-hmm. else, right? Um, so the now you got to pay attention to this, Tim. Uh, so so the terms okay. were he would pay eighty million dollars up front, okay? Then he would pay five annual installments of like sixteen point nine million dollars. Okay. So eighty million up front as a down payment, and then five sixteen point whatever million dollars to pay off the remaining eighty five million, right? Okay. But unfortunately, <laughs> and you're not going to believe this, Tim, John Spano, he was not a millionaire. Oh, what? <laughs> I mean, he was, he was a millionaire, but not enough to buy a $165 million team. And he, he, he was worth more $5 million. What? Like, how did he even get past the standard, you know, exactly. <laughs> I guess, negotiations? Exactly. Wow. So... <laughs> to to get that eighty million for um, the upfront payment, first of all, he used the team's assets. He used the team, and he used the television rights um, to get a loan. Um, but he still needed to get the sixteen point whatever million dollars for the annual payment. Um, so he had to find that money somewhere. So he tried to get more loans and borrow more money to cover that, but none of those really came through. So he decided to forge documents from oh, a boy. London, <laughs> a, a London bank, which um, went over to the owners and then the owners decided to sign the team over to him. So he was technically the Islanders owner, even though he had only paid $80 million. Wow. <laughs> um, but still, he owned the team, right? So he 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 still owed the old owners sixteen point whatever million dollars uh, for the annual payment. So he had to come up with a lot of excuses, like writing checks that bounced, or <laughs> saying he was going to send over seventeen million dollars, but re- only writing seventeen hundred dollars on the check. Oh. <laughs> And then, you know, being like, oh, you know, this is my mistake. Sorry. Um, I'll send over another one or whatever. Um, but, you know, by this time, the, the the old owners, you know, they had enough. And, you know, they went to the NHL, who went to the FBI, and they arrested uh, John Spano uh, after he had gone to the Cayman Islands, which is really weird. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he, he, he was eventually sentenced to prison. He got out of prison committed fraud again, was sent back to prison, wow. got out of prison, and now he's currently serving a 10-year prison sentence. Man, so, that's just like one portion of the book, too. <laughs> you know, that's fascinating in itself. Yeah, so so the book is about the, the Fisherman logo, and unfortunately, the Fisherman logo came out in the time that this happened. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> if you think your team has a bad history, <laughs> I know. I, know. I, I can't think of well, any of the baseball teams I know uh, that had yeah. anything that happened like like this. Oh, and I did say the um, the Yankees do play into it into this story. Uh-huh. That's because SME, which is the company that made that Fisherman logo, they uh-huh. also do the Yankees uniforms. Okay, so I don't know how you went so wrong. I know, <laughs> but <laughs> the most. Day. Classic recognizable logo in sports to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so 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 that's why um, We Want Fish Sticks by Nick Hershon is my favorite book <laughs> of 2018. It's it was such a great read. Um, he he also goes in, in, into what happened, you know, after that. The the team was eventually sold, but unfortunately the owners didn't want to put money into the team, so the team languished again team was bought again um, by a guy named Charles Wong. He had to move the team off of Long Island and move them to Brooklyn. Um, and also, I didn't know this, but apparently the, the New York Islanders lead 
all of American sports and the amount of executives that have gone to prison. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's that's four. That's not the record you want to have. <laughs> yeah, so it's four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> So have they won a championship since or no. since oh, if I could talk, have they won a championship since that dynasty where they won four in a row? No, they haven't. Um, okay. <laughs> it took them twenty three years to get out of the first round of, of the playoffs to win a playoff series. And that was only two <laughs> years ago. <laughs> wow. Um so yeah, that's uh that's why that's my favorite book. <laughs> and so I just go ahead and pick your favorite artist to be the guy who created the fisherman logo. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, that's my favorite logo. My favorite bad logo. That's ter- that, it, It's so ugly. I can't. I can't even look at it. I. I, I don't know if there's a picture of the. Um, the mascot. That you see. Um, no, not in the images. Uh, just, maybe if I just type in New York Islanders. Wait, mascot. No, no, no. T- type in uh, N Y. I S L E S Niles. Yeah, let's see, this popped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. that's uh, see, it's pretty terrible. A rule of thumb should be never create a mascot that's supposed to be a human. Kind yeah. of be an animal or like a creature, a dinosaur, then you're good. But when it's a human, they never work out well. <laughs> yeah, I think case in point is Niles. <laughs> Yeah, it looks awful, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually a funny story because um, so th- there's a there's a light, like a police light on his head, yeah. on his helmet. <laughs> I imagine that's the goalie. Yeah, like... that, that's the goal, um, you know, uh, light. Yeah. So every time the Islanders would score a goal, that light would go off, but it would have to be manually triggered. And so... <laughs> I don't know you if you can see. Have to flick the switch or something on his yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but there's a there's like a big spot around the waist, right? And that's a motorcycle battery in there. And <laughs> oh, every wow. time he has to flick the switch on the motorcycle battery to get the thing to light up. And one time it caught fire. <laughs> oh man! And the, the, the mascot had to jump out of out of that suit really quick. So. <laughs> That's funny. So it was a bad mascot. It was a bad logo. It was a bad time during the team, and the team almost got sold to a fraudster. So yeah, that's what that book is about. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never knew that existed for the Islanders. Like, <laughs> like I said, I'm not a hockey guy, but that right. is a fascinating story. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what that's my favorite book of 2018. Cool. And I guess last up would just be a favorite overall thing or experience in geek culture or whatnot that we've had in 2018. And for me, like I said, probably experience this moment was being in the theater in Infinity War once that snap happened and just seeing the audience's reaction. That was fantastic. But for me, probably my favorite thing that I got or happened in 2018 has got to be the Batman the Animated Series Blu-ray. I mean, you guys know how much I raved about that box set on the, the review episode I did for it, but I still think about how great it is. <laughs> it's how awesome and having the greatest series ever looking as beautiful as it does in that Blu-ray box set. But I got to say my favorite, one of my favorite experiences this year was watching that documentary, that new documentary they put on it, which I wasn't expecting to be that long. I knew there was going to be a new documentary. I kind of forgot about it once the Blu-ray set came out. I just wanted to see how great the series actually looked. But when I dived into that new special feature disc and saw how long the documentary was, I got really excited. And after seeing it, I was just like, thank you so much for giving me this because I have been waiting for a full-length documentary on the series put together in the way it was for so, so long. I mean, this series deserved a great look into how it all began and all the different creative people that were involved with it who don't get to talk about it that much. It was just fantastic. I mean, it touched on all sides of the creative aspect of the series. I loved it so much. And just looking at the history of Batman, the animated series, and knowing how much I love it, it was just such a treat to finally be able to see an in-depth look 
like that and just hearing all the creative forces behind it talk about it 20 years later what it was like at that time and how different it was so yeah getting the animated series box set alone just for the series and the quality that we've never seen it look like before and having this blowing me away when i first popped in a disc of an episode but then that documentary put it over the top it's probably one of the best experiences of 2018 for me so yeah i gotta give it to the animated series blu-ray box that it did not disappoint after i was looking forward to it for so much and it really really delivered yeah for me uh, i'm gonna keep it with the same theme from my last one uh, it's the 2018 2019 new york islander season uh currently sitting in first place in their division oh so, nice it's a, a rare thing <laughs> i guess in the yeah. last few years <laughs> It's a very rare thing, Tim. <laughs> um, <laughs> are they projected to be a good team? Like, expect or they're just like a surprise team this year and you're not expecting them to hold on? <laughs> they are a surprise team because they... So, in 2006, I think they um, they drafted this guy named John Tavares, right? Okay. Uh, they had the first overall pick of the NHL draft. They drafted him. Um, and he's a great player. He's really good. I've, like I, I, I've seen him do stuff that I've never ever seen before or after. Mm. Um, really great player. Um, but unfortunately, in 2018, he was in a contract year, right? Okay. And so he dra- he dragged out his contract talks with with three or four teams, and. Well, first off, he he told the Islanders that he doesn't want to be traded. You know, he wants to, and he doesn't want an op- the option on his contract. And he wants to hear. And so, you know, of course, the Islanders respected his wishes, didn't trade him, didn't give him an offer for for the option. Um, and he he dragged out his contract negotiations. Teams came in and pitched him, you know, what he can do, you know, how how much money, and. Unfortunately, he went with another team on the last day that he could mm-hmm. um, and left the Islanders, you know, with their pants down. You know, they didn't know what to do. Um, so everybody thought they would be the last or the second to the last in the, in the NHL overall. So, yeah, the 2018-2019 season has been a really great surprise. They got a new GM. They got a new coach. So, yeah, he, he, here's to hoping the second part of the season works out in their favor. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. hopefully. I mean, how when does the season go up to? Uh, like before it hits the playoffs, like the regular season, how long is it? I think March. Okay, so. Yeah. Do they have a big lead? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, <okay. So. laughs> three games. I mean, three right. points. Sorry, Tim. Three points, so. So, yeah, it's going to be, I guess, a stressful month of February. I try to hold on to that three-game lead or three-point lead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, unfortunately, they because ha- cause it's the all-star break right now. And so when they come back, they're going to have a really tough schedule. So <laughs> hopefully they can keep up that three-point lead, Tim. <laughs> yep. Otherwise, it might be your biggest disappointment of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> So, yeah, that's our future topic for our favorites of 2018. And 2019 should be another great and fun year. I mean, just looking at the categories we talked about today, I'm already anticipating what possibly could be my favorites. Like, favorite movie. We got episode nine coming out this year, TV show, Game of Thrones season eight. Got a new 311 co- album coming out this year. Ooh. So, will that be on my top for <laughs> at the end of the year? The video games, Kingdom Hearts 3. I've been waiting that for 16 years. That comes out in just like three more days. So, will that uh, deliver on the hype I have for and rank number one next year? We shall see. So, a lot of cool stuff to look forward to for 2019. So, it should be fun. Did I see that um, 311 was like crowdfunding their new album or something? No, nah, no. Nah. Oh, they have like a contract deal with the. Well, they company? they do that themselves. They're oh. they have their own record labor now. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it for a future topic, right, Tim? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's get into the bad one first. Um, DC is going to lay off and uh, lay off people, and they're refocusing uh, the company. 
Yeah, this one was surprising to me, actually, to hear it a few days ago. And it's because there was, I didn't hear about these rumors, but apparently there were rumors about, you know, Dan DiDio, Jim Lee stepping down or maybe leaving as publishers and co-publishers of DC. But they're still there. But fortunately, I think about seven people got laid off, which, you know, you never like to see. But um, the whole restructuring thing is what kind of really has me curious as far as what changes exactly is going to be done that we'll see on the comic side of things. I mean, they said they really just want to focus and have a more streamlined view as far as delivering comics and stories. So I guess the new like three main divisions of DC comics is going to be editorial production and manufacturing and publishing support services. I believe the article said too that merchandising now is not going to be under DC, but just under Warner brothers. So yeah, I'm just really interesting to hear or see how this is going to affect their comics moving forward. Are they going to, move away from, you know, the two monthly issues now, what kind of like a Batman has, they kind of stepped back from that a lot since rebirth began. There's not that many two issue a month stories that are out there or titles. I should say, um, I think Batman might be the last Batman and the Superman titles might be the last ones. If I remember it correctly, but I'm not sure. So I wonder if that's sort of going to continue. And it's just, if they're talking about streamline are the main characters really not going to have a lot of, more than two titles right now because uh, to me that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to sell action comics and Su- and superman are the only two superman books right now which is such as detective and batman are kind of just the two main ones so i don't think that would be the worst thing in the world if they kind of really stick with that and just not kind of overexposing and having so many titles for one character to choose from so We'll see, but I'm wondering if the whole rebirth initiative is going to go away as well. As far as that, are they going to try something new again and kind of get rid of what rebirth did? Because I felt rebirth did a lot of a lot of good and bringing forth back things that DC lost, important part of its history that it lost with the New Fifty Two, and now it's being reincorporated back, which I don't think they really fulfilled on just yet. I think we're all waiting for the Doomsday Clock story to wrap up to see how that's going to change things. So I'm just wondering if with these new changes at DC and editorial, if certain plans that were maybe set forth in Rebirth, if any of those is going to be changed. Because it has been, you know, taken a while if there was a plan since Rebirth began to really bring back and incorporate everything that they wanted to that was lost in the New 52. If it's taken too long and now they have a different vision that maybe they want to implant here so we'll see but it'll, it'll be interesting to see but um yeah, what did ca- catch me by surprise when i first read this uh, dc had to lay off seven percent of its force and you know they're just restructuring things over there so we'll see how it turns out and hopefully it's for the better yeah i see um on the side here there's a uh there's like a trailer for spider-man far from home <laughs> like wow yeah i want to watch that trailer again <laughs> Uh, that was a good trailer and yeah. i mean, seeing mysterio and all this fishbowl helmet glory uh, yeah well, that was enough for me to be super excited for it. <laughs> it's not only that it's also the fact that i think this is the first villain or actor villain vic, villain actor um that we've gotten since jack nicholson that's actually like a really big actor that's not you know oh if you watch this tv show girls you know, Adam, this guy, Adam Drivers on, on that show, you know, so. I'm trying to think, well, speaking of Spider-Man, we had Michael Keaton as the vulture for uh, Homecoming. Yeah, but Michael Keaton, not so much, you know, he, he doesn't really have that pedigree that Jack Nicholson had, you know, whereas if you look at Jake Gyllenhaal, you know. Yeah, but he is a big name, movies. though. But you know, like, you know who Michael Keaton is when you hear the name. I don't know. I don't know, you know. You think so? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I meant for people younger than us, Tim. I mean, have you really heard of Michael Keaton? You know, I'm actually hearing people, you know, you always got the naysayers. No matter how good something looks, yeah. you got people saying, well, why is everyone freaking out about Spider-Man Far From Home? I'm like, we're making a big deal about Mysterio. I don't even know who Jake Gyllenhaal is. Like, who is this guy? You don't know <laughs> who Jake Gyllenhaal is. <laughs> I've seen some of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Yeah, they're lost. <laughs> yeah. But but I actually like like that because yeah I'm just wondering how that would work out in this current day because we we haven't really had that Liam Neeson maybe um, yeah but yeah well, that's something to think that. about yeah. <laughs> with all the comic book movies we got I got to think about the different castings and the villains that have been in these roles to see if anyone kind of has that 
high name pedigree that Jack Nicholson did as Joker. Kurt Russell. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you go for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Guardian, yeah. Not really Josh Brolin, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Not not on that level, I'd agree. Yeah. With, even though he was mm-hmm. great as Thanos. <laughs> Uh, Black Panther, Michael B. Jordan, not so much uh, unless you like the the those Rocky movies. Um, hmm. who's the villain in um? Oh, Tilda Swinton. No, not so much. No, not uh, really. What do you say, Jeff Bridges for Iron Man? Hmm. I mean, he's got the big Lebowski. Not that uh, Nicholson level. Wait. No, not that Nicholson level. Yeah. Like. Like, I'd want to see, like, George Clooney, you know, mm-hmm. be a villain. Hmm. And Mickey Rourke in Iron Man 2. No. I, I mean, he was kind of, like, not really, but he, that was, like, when he was kind of coming back. <laughs> as being oh, yeah. Of a... <laughs> yeah, he had the wrestler. Well, um, I got one. Hmm. Robert Redford, Winter Soldier. There you go. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a good <laughs> one. You know, you have a legendary actor, an actor with pedigree. Yeah. Mm. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah, that might be the most more recent one. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a new Shazam TV spot. Uh, Which I don't think has a high recognizable name as the villain. I mean, I love Mark Strong, but <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's up there. <laughs> Mark Strong the one in the Green Lantern movie? Yeah, he was arguably the best Sinestro? part about it. Yeah, he was yeah. awesome at Sinestro. And now it just makes me mad that we'll never see him as Sinestro again because he was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> It's not, uh, uh, I almost said Ryan Adams, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds, uh, as, <laughs> as Hal Jordan. That wasn't your favorite part of the movie, Tim? Hey, I, I'd argue, I mean, I defend that movie more so than others, and I'll defend right. Ryan Reynolds' performance, too. I don't think it was as bad as it's made it out to be, but it just could have been better <laughs> as far as what he was given to work with. What about uh, Blake Lively? Well, see, I didn't have a problem, big of an issue with her, either. I thought... The cast was fine. It was just there were I, some unneeded aspects of yeah. <laughs> some of the stuff that they did, and even uh, what was his name, Skarsgård as Hector Hammond. He just oh right, just, Peter. Sarsgaard. He shouldn't have as big a role as he had in the movie. And uh, what's his name? Wasn't what's his name in that movie? Oh man, I'm forgetting his name. From Shawshank Redemption. Oh, uh, Tim Robbins. Tim Robbins. Yeah. Would you consider him part of the elite crew? You know, Kurt Russell and mm, I. Jack not Nicholson. really, but yeah. maybe it's because I haven't seen much of his movies. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think his name is quite up there. Yeah. But anyway, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's an antique spot. I think, at least from what I've seen so far, Mark Strong is probably going to be in a more successful DC movie with Shazam than Green Lantern. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I'm just loving how it looks. I'm kind of surprised we don't have just a full-blown new trailer yet. I mean, it comes out in April. I imagine maybe next week we'll get one, but in February we should probably get a brand new trailer. But yeah. this was a cool new TV spot to get. There was that awesome shot where Billy Bats is jumping off the roof. He says Shazam and immediately turns <laughs> into his adult uh, super-powered form. I just... It's simple, but I just love seeing those moments where he just says Shazam and he transformed. Just seeing that on screen is really cool. And then just the action looks awesome, too, to seeing him fight Mark Strong's Dr. Savannah. There's a lot of, like, Man of Steel <laughs> vibes going on with this fight in the sky, but I'm sure it's not going to be as brutal as that Man of Steel fight. But everything about it still looking like a fun, cool superhero movie. So I, the more I see of it, the more I'm looking forward to actually seeing the whole movie when it comes out in April. Was Zachary Levi really in... Thor? Uh, yeah. Huh. I, he played I, one I of do the not remember. Three. He, I think Frandrell? See, I'm... Hmm. Much as I love the Marvel characters and the Marvel movies, the Thor side of things, I'm, I still don't... The names of certain characters don't roll off the tongue <laughs> in his universe, like the Warriors 3. I think his name yeah. was Frandrell. Or Frandrell. See, I'm going to look it up right now. I don't want to sound like a total idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not remember him from those movies. But. He was only in the second one and third one, but in the third one, he was killed off in two seconds. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Fandral. That's Fandral? Oh, yeah. Okay. He's like, he's like the Robin Hood type character. And speaking of Thor, how come uh, Natalie Portman isn't in any of these Thor movies, the Avengers movies? Like, like Pretty um, much she's done. never really liked that. No. <laughs> she was done with the role, yeah. I remember when uh, 
Patty, remember when Patty Jenkins was supposed to direct Thor: The Dark World? Yeah. Uh, I think Natalie Portman really got upset when it kind of didn't work out, where she she didn't. Oh. Like, her and Marvel had disagreements on it, and then yeah. she left. Natalie Portman wasn't happy about that, so I think she was kind of done with it then and there, but had to fulfill her contract obligation probably for the sequel. Is did did they kill off her character in that? No, um, they just said hmm. that she broke up with Thor in the third one. They just casually mention it in the conversation Thor was having with Loki. <laughs> that's, that's oh, that's great. It really, it's she's, she's not missed to be honest. I mean, yeah, it's it's good to especially with Thor Ragnarok where they just went completely out there as far as you know going to different planets and worlds yeah. and stuff and exploring more of his. Uh, mythology that's off of earth so which was kind of i think better off for the franchise instead of having having him still be tethered to earth and just kind of i guess say that for avengers movies yeah that's uh, i don't know i just thought that was weird because you know you look at pepper Potts and she's like in every single movie yeah. even if it's only like three seconds you know so it's weird how i mean i guess you gotta <laughs> you, you gotta make the actress happy right <laughs> Yeah, you can't just switch up with all the people you're working with over the course of 20 movies not everyone's going to be happy <laughs> yeah uh, but speaking of uh, Marvel movies the the Black Panther movie is the first superhero movie to get a best picture nomination Tim finally yes <laughs> I mean, yeah we've been wanting to, wanted to talk about this because yeah of course it's Marvel movie news related but still I think this is so important for the superhero movie genre. And of course we can go back to 2008 when, or I should say 2009 when the nominations came out for the movies of 2008, the dark Knight was just flat out snubbed. <laughs> There's just no other way around it. That should have been the first, but it set off a chain of events that really got, you know, the discussion going for superhero movies to be taken more seriously by the Academy to be considered for best picture. I mean, it created the whole, 10 nominations for the best picture category was because of the dark Knight, even though no superhero movie or comic book movie got nominated because of that. But the fact 10 years later, now we're at this point where a superhero movie is nominated, I think is great. And I think uh, black Panther is very deserving for that just for the movie. It is. And just the cultural impact that it had when it first came out and the, just the great success that that film had. And I always feel too, when there's a movie that just, you know, blows everyone away, breaks box office records like Star Wars did in 1977, and something we never seen before. That does obviously deserved its nomination. And I'd even argue, even The Force Awakens when that came back, was it the best Star Wars movie? No, but the impact it had and the success and just how it broke so many records, I think it should be recognized for for that and just getting a nomination. And with Black Panther, I kind of apply to that too. It, uh, you just heard of my favorite movies of 2018. It wasn't my favorite film. Um, even the Marvel movies, that's Infinity War, but I true it fully deserves its nomination because of the impact and the cultural phenomenon it became when it came out last February. So I think it more than deserves its nomination. And just the fact that we finally kind of broken that barrier, I think it's going to lead the way for more comic book movies and superhero films to be recognized by the ca- Academy to get that nomination for Best Picture. And I one thing I just got to vent a little bit, the fact Uh-oh. that I'm seeing some fans or comic book movie fans, superhero superhero movie fans upset about this is just mind boggling to why? me. Why? Why? I know. Why are you upset? <laughs> because I mean, they is they feel I, why is this yeah. the first movie to be nominated for Best Picture? It's not that great, and you know, some people would even argue have like theories of saying, "Oh, it's just an agenda because you know of you know having it be mainly of an african-american cast and that's why it's it's the only reason why it's being recognized it's like no but i think that played into the impact and why successful it was obviously i mean it was a movie comic book movie that like no other really and audiences ate it up it was great it was something different and unique so the fact that to be honest um, i'll probably get trouble for saying this i think it's mainly bitter dc fans (laughs) who are upset (laughs) that oh because i think they just have a an agenda against Marvel movies in general because they're just mm. upset about the success they're having. Now they can say they have a best picture nominated movie and DC can't say that. And I think they just automatically get upset by that, which is sad because it's 
it's a win for all of us who are a fan of these movies. I mean, how can even if it wasn't your favorite, like how can you just not be excited that oh cool, a superhero movie finally got nominated? That's awesome. Yeah. So it's just yeah, <laughs> it's just well, frustrating to see that side of it still pop up. Well, you know, Black Panther for me has been kind of a refreshing take on the superhero genre. You mm-hmm. know, it's well for me anyway because it's. It's not what I thought it was going to be, which is computers fighting each other, uh, computer cartoons fighting each other. You know, there was actually a deep, <laughs> deep story. In it's, th- that. it's funny you say that, Dane, because if I have one complaint about Black Panther, it is because, it of, that is because final, of that that final fight between Black Panther and Killmonger was oh. a little too CG. Yeah. And, you know, I'm someone who doesn't mind that, but I felt that while we saw the awesome fight choreography that Black Panther had in Civil War, I wanted to see more of that in his own movie and i felt we didn't quite get that at the yeah. end and his final fight was killmonger so that's like pretty much my only nitpick about it because <laughs> it was mainly just those cg aspects of it we'll put it this way i i mean i guess i'll say it's the the best marvel movie i see i saw in a while mm-hmm. and i would put it over infinity war um but i think it goes more to what you were saying about cultural phenomenon right yeah you know the you saw all the news stories and you saw the news stories about, you know, these youth groups going out and trying to raise yeah, funds awesome. so that mm-hmm. the, they could see it, you know, they they could buy out a screening. And so I think it's more nominated for, I mean, it's a great movie. It's a great story. It was shot great, everything, right? But mm-hmm. you also have to give a nod to that. Right? Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you also have to acknowledge it because... Yeah, it was a cultural phenomenon, and that's why it's nominated for Best Picture. And if you can't accept that, then, I don't know, you might want to try, look at the larger picture. Mm-hmm. You know, just... it's it's not just about, you know, oh, there's a bunch of African-American actors and actresses and, you know, a director that's making a movie. It's it's about the larger picture, you know. it's It's not so... It's not so much about that. And if you're angry about that, then, you know, you also have to look about, look at all all these screenings, you know, these groups trying to buy out screenings and how much it means to, to those people, you know? Yeah. Instead of, you know, I guess going after the low hanging fruit and saying, yeah, that's you know, kind of what oh, it seems it's, like. it's because, you know, it's an African American movie and, there's it's like, like some see people like saying, oh, it's just the politics of it. They're only, you know, doing that to get recognized and attention because of that. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's, yeah. I don't know, it's, just, it's just frustrating where you think there's all these fans out there who just want to see these movies succeed because it's just great for the genre in general. But then you got to, you know, that whole taking sides and thing and just looking at all these different reasons and yeah. try to validate your reason why it shouldn't be. Just be happy that <laughs> one of these movies got recognize for that even if it's not your favorite I don't, and like you said you can't deny i think no i bet you some of these people a lot of these people are complaining haven't even seen it <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me at all either yeah and you know I, I i guess the point is like how would you correlate that excuse or that that anger into another best picture nomination how would you do that for Bohemian Rhapsody, mm-hmm. or see what up, or how, how would you do that for The Shape of Water? You know, how how would you take those arguments and those complaints and apply that to a sh- The Shape of Water? You know, can't really yeah. do it. So yeah, it it definitely deserves its Best Picture nomination. So. I and I will say, too, thank goodness they didn't go through with that. Well, I forget the actual name, but the most popular event movie or some of the oh, year. Remember right, they were right. having that year? <laughs> Which, yeah, that just it, that really would have felt like catering and just like having like a secondhand Oscar award. Like you're not good enough for best picture, but we'll give you your own category to see if you can win that. So thankfully they didn't do that. And Black Panther is officially a best picture nominated superhero movie. And I think that's awesome. So. I don't know if it's gonna win, but yeah. I'll be pulling for it. I'm just trying to look up like the the Oscar nominations for Best Picture. Yeah, 
Let's see. Uh, I'm sure they're all movies I haven't seen except for Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't okay. want a gallery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got them up right here. Okay, what is it? So, so Bohemian Rhapsody, which I still uh, want to see. I, I don't know if it. I want to see that. <laughs> well, it's kind of part of me. I, I, since I like Queen, I want to see the story, but now we right. got the whole Drama. Brian Singer like, yeah. <laughs> stigma. is like, you know, right, like, right. <laughs> And then uh, Black Klansman, which is another one I want to see. I heard it's really yeah, good. Yeah, that one is really good. I saw that. Then A Star is Born. Mm, didn't see that. Yeah, that one I really don't have an interest in, but I heard it's good. Uh, the Favorite, which it's not ringing any bells. <laughs> and then Green Book, which that kind of looked interesting. And then Roma, which is that Netflix movie. See, I have a feeling that's going to win. I, I have seen that. That's a really good movie. Um, I don't know if it's for you, Tim. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, it's, it's, I mean, the, 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 the set pieces are amazing in it. Mm. it it's, it's the long takes, you know, like, okay. uh, like, like the daredevil fight scenes. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just like somebody walking down a street and stuff. And I don't know if it's for you, <laughs> but I've heard it got really good buzz. I just have a feeling that this might be something that will set a new precedent where it's kind of like how Black Panther is the first superhero movie to be nominated. This is the first, you know, Netflix original movie to be nominated. Oh, right. I could just see it winning and have that be, you know, the, like a new precedent of more of these type of straight to Netflix movies be considered. So if I had to pick one, I'd probably say Roma's going to win it, even though I'll be rooting for Black Panther. Yeah. And then finally there's Vice, which I also want to see. Just, oh, just the see great uh, Christian Bale. Christian Bale <laughs> movie. Yeah. 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 Is he, is he nominated for best actor? Yeah. Mm. Oh. Which I hope he wins as well. <laughs> yeah. He gained all that weight. I know. It's just insane, man. I mean, He's, I think he's going to go down as one of the best actors ever. Just how dedicated he is to each role, no matter what, you know, how extreme physically he has to take things, whether to be so skinny and then put on the pounds here for this movie. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it'll be interesting. Yeah, I think I want Vice to win because of Christian Bale. <laughs> I haven't seen the movie yet, but I just want Vice to win because yeah. of <laughs> Christian Bale. <laughs> um. But yeah, that's it for our news. Uh, good luck to Black Panther. I hope, um, I hope they they win, right, Tim? Yeah, just the hopefully the start of more superhero movies get recognized. Yeah, when they're as good, not just to put any random one, but <laughs> when one deserving, it'll hopefully get recognized now. Uh, but now we can move on to our conversation with Alex slash listener feedback, and we do have an email from uh, Jordan, right, Tim? Yes, we do. Okay. So Jordan says, hey, my bat brothers, I love the new podcast name. I'm super, I'm super happy you guys are still here, and I hope that never changes. When I first started listening to podcasts almost four years ago, you guys were on the first ones or one of the first ones I listened to, and I've been hooked on your podcast ever since. Even though we've never met in person, although I have Skyped with Tim, which I guess is the closest thing to that, I truly consider you guys some of my best friends thanks to almost four years of now listening to your podcast and corresponding back and forth. How did he week, Skype with you? Uh, I was on an episode of the podcast he was on oh, almost oh, right, a year or two right, ago right. now. Yeah. Oh. Um, he goes, every other week, I look forward to your new podcast episode with eager anticipation. I have so many memories of listening to your podcast in different places and at different points in my life. For example, you guys are with me all through college, and I have vivid, bat-tastic memories of listening to your podcast in different places on campus. I just wanted to say thank you for all of that. Oh, Jordan. Well, that's awesome, man. I mean, thank you for sharing that. That that means the world to me, and I'm sure Dane that you've been with us that long and you consider it one of your favorites. And just like you consider us as your friends, we consider the same to you. So, which is great, and we really appreciate that. Yep, Jordan is our bat friend. I mean, he puts totally. bat yep. bat. See, it says bat Jordan, so he's our bat friend. Uh, but yeah, I echo the same sentiments as Tim. Uh, yeah. So- much appreciated there, yeah. Jordan. And yeah, he said, hope that never changes. We hope that never changes as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, we, we got to finish the commentary, Tim. Yeah, at the very least, I mean, we got to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Even if something happens, we get framed for a crime we didn't commit and we're in jail. We still got to somehow make that commentary work <laughs> and get it recorded and finished. <laughs> but he continues saying, 
Uh, two other M-rated games besides the one you mentioned that are on the Nintendo Switch are my two favorite video games of all time, Batman the Telltale series and Batman the Enemy Within. Yeah, it's crazy as we were talking about how many M-rated games are on the Switch in our last episode. I still sometimes forget those Telltale Batman games are rated M. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know Why? the Enemy Within is, but the first one, that was rated M also? Why? I mean, it might be, but is there... I'll take... I'll take Jordan at his word for it, but I always forget that those are M-rated titles. Is there like swearing in it, or maybe the the subject matter, or maybe some of the violence that happens? Oh yeah, I see. I don't think there is that much swearing in it, but yeah, yeah, I keep forgetting about those, and which sadly we're not going to get any more of. <laughs> <laughs> but but they are they, uh, not Telltale. Uh, they got somebody to finish the last season of uh, The Walking Dead, so. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that would have been the worst. A game that was in production, almost finished, but then wasn't able to be finished, that would, would have been awful for fans of that, <laughs> those, that game series. Right. But Jordan continues saying, I'm super pumped about the Batwoman pilot being ordered. As I talked about in my last email, I love what we see of her in Elseworlds, and I can't wait for more. It is also super exciting to me that David Nutter will be directing said pilot, as I love everything I've seen of his. He directed the pilots for both Smallville and Arrow, the first two episodes of The Flash, and a ton of episodes of Superboy. Plus, his track record for pilots he directs getting picked up to the series is Batastic. One thing I think may happen leading up to the premiere of Batwoman now that she's made her debut in Elseworlds is that there will be even more Bat references in the Flareoverse. <laughs> I never heard of that one, the Flareoverse, but it's always just Arrowverse to me. But um, more Bat references in the Flareoverse than before because in The Flash... Flash's mid-season premiere, the first episode following Elseworlds, we immediately got a Batastic nod to Wayne Tech with the car in that episode being manufactured by them. Yeah, I noticed that too, Jordan. Seems like now that Elseworlds was a success, the Gotham and Batman references are going to be coming out of the woodwork now, <laughs> probably yeah. leading up to Bad Woman. What about Supergirl? Like, Sue Flareoverse? Or... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that might be it. Yeah. Souffleroverse. Souffleroverse. Yeah, Souflero, Souflero verse. Souflero verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's gonna now with that one, it would have to be Sue Bat Flareover. <laughs> yeah. It's still got the Legends of Tomorrow, which I've kind of fallen off on, but there was another name to throw in. <laughs> right. Man, you know, I, I know we're reading uh, Jordan's email. It has nothing to do with it, but I really want to watch Black Panther right now. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Well, we've been talking about it, so yeah. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> but after the, or another thing I'm super pumped about is Justice League versus the Fatal Five. I've watched the first look for it that came with Reign of the Superman that hadn't been released yet when you talked about the casting for the film. It looks like Justice League versus the Fatal Five will be the second movie in the DCU AOM line to be set in the DCAU continuity, following in the footsteps of Batman and Harley Quinn. It'll be super cool to hear Kevin Conroy, George Newbern, and Susan Eisenberg all back in their respective roles as the Trinity and to see that animation style once again. Not only is this film a Justice League slash Justice League Unlimited reunion, but it's also a reunion for my favorite animated series, The Batman. We've got The Batman's John Grayson, Kevin Conroy, Superman, George Newbern, Joker, Kevin Michael Richardson, Penguin, Tom Kenny, Vicki Vale, Tara Strong, and Curator from What Goes Up, Peter Jessop, all, all in it. Tim, speaking of the Batman, there's another episode of it I want to specifically recommend to you in addition to the breakout Blast Max, Blast production episode. Knowing how much you love Nightfall and knowing how much you do love Bruce and Alfred's relationship, as do I on both counts, Traction is one of the best episodes of season one. It's the show's introduction of Bane, and it takes several cues from Nightfall, including some super emotional stuff with Bruce and Alfred. Now, of course, I recommend the entirety of The Batman, but Traction and The Breakout are two episodes that I recommend for you specifically, Tim. Getting back to Justice League versus The Fatal Five, in terms of the rest of the cast, I'm familiar with Matthew Yanking, uh, Sumali Mon Montano, Daniela Babadilla, and Noel Fisher, who have all been in multiple DC roles previously. And I'm super pumped to see them all return in the DC universe in this film. I wonder if we'll get to hear from Starboy about how Supergirl is doing from the events of Justice League Unlimited episode Far From Home. Yeah, speaking of the Justice League versus the Fatal Five, I'm with you, Jordan. When I first saw that preview video that was on the Reign of the Superman Blu-ray 
well, I haven't gotten it yet, but it's been online and on YouTube and all that. I was super excited about seeing the animated style for Justice League Unlimited back. I was not expecting that. I've heard the voice cast, like we talked about in the last episode of Kevin Conroy, George Newbern, and Susan Eisenberg. But kind of like how Justice League Doom was a totally different animation style, I was expecting that for Justice League versus the Fatal Five. But seeing that Batman design exactly from Justice League Unlimited, I was excited. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever see that again. And I did always loved that Batman design. So it's going to be awesome not only to hear Kevin Conroy's voice, but that awesome Batman design as well. So I agree. It is almost like it's continuing on the Justice League from the DCAU, which is awesome. And as far as that Batman episode... I actually can't say I saw it because when it was first airing back in 2004, I did see the first few episodes of the first season. But honestly, I can't say I remember it too much being, you know, over 15 years ago. So I that is definitely one I'll revisit again once I have access to the series. So I got that one and then the Black Mass episode. I'll definitely make note of those two as my first go to episodes of the series. And he continues saying, while I'm on the subject of the DCAUOM line, now is probably a perfect time for me to give non spoilerly thoughts on Reign of the Superman. I got to see it in theaters as a double feature with The Death of Superman, but not combined into one film like they did with Batman The Dark Knight Returns, and will be doing with these two later this year. And it was a bad-tastic experience. I then watched the film a second time two days later when it came out on digital. Just to clarify, since you brought it up on your last podcast... New entries in the DCU AOM line will indeed be available on the DC Universe digital service starting with Reign of the Superman, but it will be on the same day as each one releases on physical media, not digitally. Uh, got it. Thanks for clearing that up, Jordan. That's what I wasn't remembering on. But still, even if it's the same day as the Blu-ray, I think that's still a really cool feature that the service is going to have. But he continues saying, therefore, Reign of the Superman won't be on the DC Universe digital service until January 29th, but it is out now digital. And getting back to my thoughts... Like I was saying, I love it. It really does a Batastic job giving ample time to all the replacement Superman and features Batastic portrayals of each of my favorite uh, being from Gotham's Cameron Monaghan as Superboy. Jason O'Mara continues to be one of my favorite Batman voice actors, and he has a super hilarious line in the film that has had me cracking up both times I've seen it. The final battle of the film is intense and is worthy successor to the epic Superman vs. Doomsday, Superman vs. Doomsday fight from Death of Superman. I'm super eager to hear your thoughts when you see Reign of the Superman. Yeah, it comes out this Tuesday, so I'll definitely be picking up the Blu-ray of it, and we'll give my review on it on our next episode for sure. And much as I eagerly anticipated Tom King writing the Joker leading up to what he did in The War of Jokes and Riddles, as Professor Pig is one of my other top favorite villains, he's another I'd been hoping Tom would eventually write, and that is exactly what he does in Batman 62, which I absolutely adore. Spoilers. Tom crafts a horrifying story with Professor Pig, and it's made even scarier by Mitch Gerard's art. We've seen so many writers brilliantly tackle Batman's inner dialogue, but Tom does something super unique with it that I've never seen anyone else do before. He really allows us to see how Batman thinks through the tough situations he's put in like I've never experienced before. I love how that shines a spotlight on how Batman is the world's greatest detective. It also is super gross when Batman describes swallowing that blood that Professor Pig douses him with. My favorite moment in the whole issue comes from that inner monologue, and it makes me bawl. It's so heartbreaking. And her, hey, Tim, you, did, did you see on Twitter like a couple weeks ago that Tom King had to defend himself? Uh, yeah, I noticed that he's saying like he might have to start blocking more people than usual. I didn't get yeah. into the reasons why, but I'm sure it's the typical fanboy nonsense. No, it was because people were saying that, because I guess Tom King was in the CIA before he became a Batman writer. Yeah, huh? Right? And uh, people were doubting his uh, his service in the CIA. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I put that up there with typical fanboy nonsense, not yeah. thinking anything they think is right and what the, anyone else does not. So. Yeah, so he had to post like a picture of himself and... A picture, because apparently, I guess the, the the lawyers need to proofread his material before he submits it. Mm, okay, so that yeah. I heard, uh, that's yeah. interesting. I, I'm not sure if it's on everything, but I guess some things. So I guess maybe that's that, some, yeah, that's yeah. maybe related to that. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, so that, that that's a little stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've seen somewhere like people. I saw him like saying like blocking people who are attacking him and his wife, which yeah, yeah of course is. Sadly, it doesn't surprise me, but still, I'll keep 
can't believe people would sink that low. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just <laughs> no. thought that was, I remember reading that. I'd be like, really? Why would he lie about that? Because that yeah. <laughs> can, that can be easily easily confirmed or denied or whatever. I know. <laughs> uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but as far as the favorite quote that Jordan's talk about, he goes, um, the quote is, and her, you asked her, she said, yes, you went to the rooftop. You reassess it or reassess it, evaluate. I'm lost. Oh, dear God. I'm on my knees and I'm lost. Batman is super smart. He's the world's greatest detective and he has the willpower of a Green Lantern. So he can find his way out of just about any jam, but he can't find a solution to having the love of his life leave him. He is truly lost for the first time in his life. It reminds me of the Batman hushed interlude where Alfred tells Catwoman that he was that he has sewn Batman's flesh, set his bones and removed more spent bullets from his body than he cares to remember. But that there's one thing he wouldn't have the slightest clue how to mend a broken heart. As Batman tells Catwoman when he proposes for the first time in Batman 24, he needs her. That is a perfect segue into talking about the preview pages for Batman 63, which dropped today as I'm writing this. The issue will be out by the time you record your next podcast episode, but it isn't quite or out quite yet as of my writing, just two more days. So I'll just talk about the preview pages and then talk about the whole issue on my next email. These preview pages had me sobbing, sobbing all in caps, <laughs> like tears rushing down my face as I try to catch my breath sobbing. As soon as I saw the first panel of the first preview page, I knew what was going on, and I audibly gasped and started crying. Things began to play out as exactly as they do at the end of Batman 50, just as Bruce is about to leap off the rooftop. He hears Bat. Selina arrived. She tells Bruce the same thing he tells her when he processes or when he proposes in Batman 24. I need you, which is a super beautiful parallel. And then we get the page that just got me uncontrollably sobbing. It's so beautiful. Bruce and Selina share a super passionate kiss there on the rooftop. I know it's a nightmare and not real, but seeing things play out like this makes me super happy nonetheless. Then we see another beautiful bat cat kiss on the very next page where Bruce and Selina are on the beach, presumably on their home honeymoon. I love how Constantine's voiceover describes the sky just as we see it behind Bruce and Selina there. I obviously adore Bruce and Selina, as you know, and I also love the beach. So seeing those two things combined is batastic for me. Then we get another bat cat kiss on the Gotham City's iconic gargoyles. For those counting at home, like me, that's three bat cat kisses just in the preview pages for this issue. Catwoman tells Batman she has to go, and he tells her, don't go, please. Of course, that can be that can be interpreted in two ways. As things really played out, Catwoman left Batman, so perhaps that's Bruce's unconscious knowledge of what really happened despite being in this idyllic nightmare coming out of him and begging for a different outcome. However, I also just adore how Batman wants to be with Catwoman every second that he can be. In the nightmare, she's just going back to Wayne Manor, which she calls home, it's her home now, too, as Holly makes reference in Batman 50, and that makes me super happy, too. And Batman doesn't even want to be apart from Catwoman for a few hours. That reinforces again how much he loves her. I also, or it also foreshadows the dynamic we will see once Batman and Catwoman finally do get married, which I'm thinking is going to happen in Batman 75. More on that shortly. Where Batman and Catwoman are a married crime-fighting power couple. But perhaps Catwoman doesn't patrol with him all the time, as she says in this issue. The preview pages end with, I love you, Cat. I love you too, Bat. Beautiful. This all reminds me a bit of the Batman the Animated Series episode, Perchance the Dream, where Bruce is in a dream world where he and Selina are engaged. However, in this case, when Bruce comes back to reality, he will actually still get married to Selina. Based on the solicitations that were just released, it looks like Bruce and Selina will reunite for real in Batman 69. With Bruce getting close to discovering Bane's plot against them now, my guess is that he will do so at the end of Nightmares, and then issues 70 through 74 will deal with, ba will deal with Batman and Catwoman teaming up to defeat Bane. The timing then would be perfect for the next milestone issue of the run, Batman 75. To be where Batman and Catwoman finally get married, Tom has said as a huge, or Tom has said a huge bad event will take place in that issue. Anyway, my excitement level for Batman 63 is through the roof, and I can't wait to read the whole issue on Wednesday. Hear your thoughts on it. And then share the rest of mine. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on the preview pages and Batman 62. Because unfortunately, Jordan, I'm behind <laughs> on my Batman books. Right now, the way I'm budgeting my comic buying schedule, 
Batman falls into a period where I don't read it in time for our podcast recording, but I'm hoping to get caught up and have it where I'm reviewing both Batman and Detective Comics soon, but right now I'm a little bit behind. But I'm definitely still going to read them, though, and we'll let you know what I think when I do get a chance, because I know 63 came out this past week, and I have to get that in 62, so probably next week is when I'll get both of them, but I'll definitely let you know what I think once I get a chance to read them and hopefully get back to a more regular schedule of being able to review them for the podcast. But he continues saying, while Tom's Batman run can't be touched for me, I'm also loving what Peter J. Tomasi is doing over in tech too. And I highly recommend going back and checking out Brian Hill and James Robinson's arcs in between James Tinney and, and Peter as well. As I thought those were batastic too. Spoilers, that scene where Batman is racing in the Batmobile to save Leslie is super harrowing and suspenseful, and it harkens back to several other Batastic moments in Batman's history for me. Leslie laughing as she tries to speak reminds me of Batman Beyond Return of the Joker when Terry finds Bruce Joker rise on the floor. Batman racing desperately to save Leslie reminds me of both the scene in Identity Crisis where Batman and Robin are racing to save Jack Drake and the scene in Batman Begins where Batman is racing in the Batmobile to save Rachel. It had me on the edge of my seat, just as all those scenes, it reminds me of always, or let me read that again. <laughs> it had me on the edge of my seat, just as all those scenes, it reminds me of always do. I always get Batman Begins vibes from seeing Henry Ducard in Detective Comics 996, of course. And Peter also brings in a cute I can from the Batman the Animated Series, which is super cool. With stuff this major happening in these issues, leading up to issue 1000, it makes me even more pumped for what is in store for us in that issue. And okay, a couple of questions to wrap up this email. First up is, in the last email, I asked who your top five Dick Grayson voice actors are. And in this email, I thought I would um, ask for the, the favorite Barbara Gordon voice actresses. And his choices are, um, number five, Mary Kay Bergman. Number four, Tara Strong. Number three, Angie Harmon. Just for her performance for Barbara's conversation with Terry about what happened the night the Joker died alone would get her a spot this high on this list. Number two, Kelly Martin. And number two, Danielle uh, Judovitz. I hope I'm saying that name right. Uh, which I assume she's a voice actress from The Batman, which I haven't seen too many episodes of, but I'm not too familiar with. But for me, I would go number one, Tara Strong. I love her Batgirl portrayal in the new Batman adventures. And for me, it's become the definitive voice actress for Batgirl, the one I always hear in my head when I read comics. The number two, I'll go with Melissa Gilbert, the first actress to voice Barbara in Batman the Animated Series. And then number three, I agree, Jordan Angie Harmon, her voice as the older Barbara Gordon was fantastic, especially in Return of the Joker, like you mentioned. Totally agree. And then I'm going to go with Ashley Green, who voiced uh, Barbara in Arkham Knight. Um, I thought she did a good job, not only in the game, but then in the DLC where you actually get to play as Batgirl, which is cool. And then number five, I'm going to go with Mae Whitman, who voiced Batgirl in The Brave and the Bold and the DC Superhero Girls. I haven't seen her work in the DC Superhero Girls, but I know uh, she did good in Brave and the Bold. And she also does a great job as April O'Neil in the 2012 Ninja Turtle series, which I absolutely love. So wanted to give her props for that as well. <laughs> so those would be my top five Barbara Gordon voice actresses. Uh, for me, it's Tara Strong and Tara Strong only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to argue with that, Dane. <laughs> like yeah. I said, she's the best one in my opinion, but there have been several others who've done great jobs as well. So, I'm sure there'll be more actresses soon to throw in the name to the hat of Batgirl. Just like pretty much every big DC character, especially on the Batman side. There's going to be so many actors playing these characters. <laughs> we could probably do a top yeah. 20 list for the Bat family in a couple of years. <laughs> so with all the different projects that are on. <laughs> and then number two for Jordan's questions, he goes, how would you rank the Bat suits in the Burton slash Sumarker quadrilogy? For me, it's number six, the main Batman and Robin Bat suit. Number five, the Batman and Robin Arctic bat suit. Number four, the Batman Forever Sonar bat suit. Number three, the Batman 89 suit. And number two, the Batman Forever Panther bat suit. And number one, the Batman Returns bat suit. So I wasn't even aware the Batman Forever suit was referred to as the Panther suit. Yeah, <laughs> I never that before. <laughs> but for me, um, you know what? I hate even having these on my list, but since they're there, I'll break them at the bottom. The Batman and Robin Arctic suit and the Batman Forever Sonar suit. I just... <laughs> Always hated those costumes. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever like them. So those are way on the bottom. The number four, I'll go with the Batman and Robin suit, the main one he wore. So nipples aside, it wasn't horrible. <laughs> the, the Batman Forever suit, same thing. It's actually not a bad Batman suit if you take away the nipples. 
Then number two, I'm going to go with Batman from Batman 89. I just remember being blown away seeing a Batman suit that was all black. And I still think that's a very cool look for Batman to have that does work well on film, even though I do prefer the more comic, comic accurate one that Ben Affleck wore. I still love that. I think it's now become a classic a solid black Batman costume that Michael Keaton got to wear. But um, I agree with you, Jordan. My favorite is the Batman return suit. It still has that classic look that the 89 suit has, but just the body armor that he has is just a little more improved. I always like the look of that. So that is my favorite as well. Uh, for me, again, with like you, Tim, <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the Arctic suit from Batman and Robin, uh, the sonar suit from forever um and just because i have nothing else to go here it's gonna be the um val kilmer suit from batman forever <laughs> over uh, the batman and robin one wow or yeah. i should say under you like the batman and robin one better uh, um two is uh batman 89 and number one i'm gonna agree with all th- all two of you it's gonna be the return suit Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> it is a great costume. Yeah. Especially when he rips it off. Like, there's that cut, that weird cut. Uh, it's like he has the black eye makeup on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To me, it's a big improvement, but like I said, it was on the body armor, which I think looked better than the 89 one. But not by much, but just enough to where it is my favorite. Did they change the design of the Batwing? Um, yeah, I think they did. Mm. For Batman Forever, yeah, they definitely yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which isn't horrible, but. It's like to me, it's a little more longer, a little more streamlined. It seemed like where the '89 one was a little bulkier, but not quite as long. But yeah. I don't know. the '89 one's still the best. <laughs> the Batman and Robin Batmobile, I feel like I liked it as a kid, uh, but I look at it now and it looks awful. Yeah, I will <laughs> say I think it looks better than the Batman Forever Batmobile. That's my least favorite one. I'm trying to remember it. Um, like I said, it says. Real streamlined. It has these big Look fans in the back of it. Drives up walls. I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> Let me... Uh, Batmobile. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. No yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has ribs on it. On its what? Side. It has ribs on its side. Ribs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. That, not my favorite. And bat symbol rims. See, I'm trying to remember when I went to the Warner Brothers Studio Batman portion of the tour that held the costume in the Batmobile garage, which was yeah. really awesome. The Batman Forever Batmobile was there. but I mean, the Batman and Robin Batmobile. Now I'm trying to remember if the Batman Forever Batmobile was there. I don't remember it. Maybe they agreed to that. It is the, <laughs> the worst looking one, and they didn't even bother putting it with the others. <laughs> they made a toy. You can buy it for. Oh, of course, uh, <laughs> it's an electronic toy. I guess uh, you can get it for one hundred and fifty dollars. Tim. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's gonna be a pass. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Jordan, for your email. Yes. Uh, we always uh, enjoy reading them, and um, yeah, th- thank you for sending in your email. Um, so now we can move on to our comic book reviews, and for this episode, we only have one. It's Detective Comics number 996, getting close to 1,000, Tim. Yep, just four more to go. Um, and our rating scale for this episode is going to be, uh, hmm, what should it be, Tim? Yeah, should it be something with that Batman Forever Batmobile. <laughs> yeah. uh, amount of ribs that the, yeah. <laughs> the Batmobile has in Batman Forever. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Detective Comics 996. This is continuing. I love it when comics or stories in Detective Comics are actually mysteries and you see Batman's detective skills be put on display. That's a really big reason why I'm loving the story arc here because we've seen that before, obviously, but the fact that it's playing so close to home as far as what made Bruce become Batman and all the people involved with him becoming Batman and figuring out the mystery of who's behind the attacks and murders of these people is so fascinating to me. Mm. And I, this issue continues that with some other members who played an important role in Bruce becoming Batman. It starts yeah, off with... Can, can I interrupt you really quick? Yeah, um, go for it. I remember, I remember when they tried to do that with uh, Batman Conf- Confidential. Remember that okay. book? I remember it, but yeah. I never read any of it. <laughs> yeah, it was trying to be like a, a detective thing, but 
didn't really work out. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. I think on the Gotham Knights Online podcast when I was yeah. listening to it, how it never got good reviews. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, anyone that. that was a book that struggled, um, kind of like the Dark Knight um, uh, book. Yeah, when sorry. it first came out before the relaunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's always going to be underrated. We always say that the Greg Hurwitz storylines mm. that were in the Dark Knight book that saved the book from just being total oh, yeah. crap <laughs> from oh, beginning yeah. to end. <laughs> Oh yeah, it it had really nice art though. Yeah, that <laughs> is for sure. Yeah, uh, the the first part of the Dark Knight uh, uh, book. Yeah, not missing much <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to story, anyway. Yeah, but that cannot be said about Detective Comics, especially with Peter J. Tomasi taking over. So, like I said, it begins with Batman and Arkham looking for information from any of his crazy villains that he has locked up there, and they're not be able they're not any help and they're all beaten up <laughs> by you know not having see that's the thing i wasn't clear on if batman did this or if the person who's behind this was doing this to them making them not taught so i, I kind of got well i answered my own question right here i didn't notice this but i'm looking at the issue right now batman's walking the hallways and his gloves are all full of blood so <laughs> i assume he was beating up on the criminals and the inmates in arkham so but then he goes to back to the back cave with damien who's there for Alfred because we know Alfred got attacked by someone in a Zorro costume in the last issue. And the only thing here that I wasn't too familiar with, it seems like Batman and Damien had a bit of a falling out and there have some issues um, because Damien's saying, I'm only here for Alfred. And then Bruce, before he leaves, saying, you know, hopefully when I get back, we'll be able to patch this up. And Damien tells him, you know, if you, as long as you have an open mind, I'd like that father. So I'm not too sure what happened. Maybe it was something that, took place in the pages of Teen Titans or Super Sons, which I know Damien's been spending most of his time in. So I just wasn't sure what happened between them. But I'm sure I'll, it'll get, when, once it gets resolved, hopefully I'll read it in the pages of Detective or Batman. But Batman or Bruce goes to France because he suspects that Henry Ducard might be the next victim. And there's a cool page here that's showing Batman slowly getting the information he needs, dressing up and disguising himself as different people to get the information. The last one being Matches Malone with him torching a building with some criminals to get the information. Always love seeing Matches Malone whenever he makes an appearance. But Bruce does find Ducard holding up in this cave. And Bruce thinks he's actually... I shouldn't say Bruce thinks that uh, Ducard is the next victim. He actually thinks he's behind the attacks because he's one of the few who knows Bruce is Batman and he thinks Ducard is doing this as payback for when Damien murdered uh, Ducard's son, Nobody. Um, which is a story that took place when Peter Tomasi was doing Batman and Robin, I believe, for the New 52 in that first launch, which is a pretty cool story. But as Bruce is talking to Ducard, he's denying it, and they didn't get attacked by that monster that attacked Leslie and killed her, but it's kind of mutated into this creature who's taking on, has the faces of a lot of Batman's classic villains, like Joker, Penguin, um, Killer Croc, Scarecrow, like they're faces are all you know fighting for space on this body of this monster that looks really freaky so batman and ducard have to fight and take it out and they're not having much success so it grabs ducard but ducard decides you know he's gonna take out the monster by killing himself as he's getting pulled in he takes out two grenades and as his body gets sucked into the monster it blows up and he just tells bruce like i hope you're satisfied wayne you got not only my son but now you got me as well so he kills himself and Batman's kind of at square one, but he realizes now he puts together, okay, people are attacking everyone who helped me become Batman throughout the course of my life. Leslie, Alfred, Ducard. So now he's going to go try to help and save the other people involved with his training before it's too late. And that takes him to uh, North Korea, to the Paketu Sound Mountains, where he received his martial arts training. But he gets there too late, as a lot of the monks that were there have already been killed by the creature. But he's confronted by one of them, who, who says, you know, thinks Batman's there to attack him as well, and won't let him through. And there's this cool shot of Batman. I mean, he's not even talking to the guy. He just he says a little bit to him that he needs to see his sensei. But after that, he knows he's gonna have to fight this guard, and he just has this cool pose, kind of like in Batman '89, where. Uh, he just uh, before Bob the goon comes out of the alley with that knife and Batman just uses the fingers like come on <laughs> but then he just runs away that's the pose Batman has here which is cool so he ends up fighting uh, this the ninja here and this is as Jordan alluded to ends up being cute I can from Batman the animated series and I gotta say as I was reading this or seeing the panels of the fight that they were having I was thinking you know what 
this would be kind of cool if this was Kyodai Ken and he finally gets introduced to comics because I don't think he's been in an actual Batman comic because the design kind of looked like him. He was in black ninja garb. He has the little beard, the not quite bald head, but he has a little bit of hair on the top, but mostly balding. It reminded me of Kyodai Ken. That's made me think it'd be cool if this was actually him. So after Batman and him finished the fight, uh, Bruce's old sensei comes out saying, you almost beat to death, killed I can. And I went, yes, <laughs> they did it. This is awesome. And it's obviously a little different from the Batman, the animated series history where him and Bruce are both rivals and trained together. I always like that aspect of their story. So it looks like they're doing something different here. But the fact that he now he's now in a Batman actual main comic line, I think it's great. And hopefully he'll appear in it more and have a bigger storyline down the road. Cause I think he's such a, one of the cool original characters for created Batman in Batman, the animated series. And, Always wish he made the jump to the comics as well. So I'm really excited that that finally happened. So uh, Bruma, B- Batman realizes that his sensei is still alive and, you know, that uh, he's trying to get more information on this creature. And so um, he decides now that Kyodai Ken and the sensei are safe, uh, he says he'll be back to help, but there's another place he has to go first. And this takes him to uh, Gila, New Mexico. Where as he takes, he has to take it by a halo jump to get there. He lands and then he sees this old man running out in a Mr. Miracle costume. He just goes, Batman, get out of here now. It's a trap. And Bruce goes, this yells out Thaddeus or Thaddeus. And that's where the issue ends, where the floor starts, you know, flipping over. And Bruce tries to use the grapple, but it doesn't look like he made it. It seemed like they got trapped on the ground. And that's where the issue ends. So I wasn't too familiar with the character of Thaddeus. I just recognized, man, that's Mr. Miracle's costume. But... Uh, doing a little research on it. it, seems like he was the first Mr. Miracle before the character who was born on Apocalypse uh, inherited the costume and received training from him and became became a new Mr. Miracle. And this character, Thad- Thaddeus, trained Bruce as an escape artist uh, to get out of, you know, anytime he's tied up or in chains or whatnot. So another character who had, insigni- or had significant training in Batman's career, uh, Bruce's wanting to protect and save. So that's where the issue ends. But again, it was another solid story seeing uh, more of Bruce interact with people who shaped his training. I love that. Anytime we get a story that delves into Bruce's past and him and his training to become Batman, I always love. And this is a cool new angle to explore that as someone knows everything about Bruce and his history to become Batman. And I'm just anxious to see who's behind this. And hopefully it won't be a letdown because, you know, as I'm thinking about it in my head, I just wonder who can it be? Like, how could it, is it a new character that someone, we already familiar with, but never knew new Bruce's secrets. It's going to be interesting to find out what Tomasi has planned. And I can't wait. So another solid issue. Um, probably not didn't enjoy it quite as much as the other the past two. I thought those were great for some of the emotional stuff we got in it, but still some cool action and then uh, look into some of the characters who affected Bruce's life. So I'm going to give this three and a half out of five ribs that make up the Batmobile and Batman forever. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess that's it. Yep. From us, uh, just go over to batmanuniverse.net, facebook.com slash batmanuniverse, Twitter handles at batmanuniverse. Uh, the show's Twitter handles at batfanspodcast, Tim's Twitter handles at timg311, and my Twitter handles at Dane says banana. Um, rate and review us on iTunes, and you can send an email to the show at batfanswithoutpants at gmail.com. So with that, like we say at the end of every single episode, Tim. We love each and every one of you with all of our bat and ribs hearts. <laughs> <laughs> ribs hearts. Um, I should have said bat hearts and ribs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with that, see you guys next time. See you next time, everybody. Yeah.